And now PA says, question for Neil. How does he see interpretability playing a role in AI security, not alignment, for example, crafting more exotic jailbreaks? And he says to tell you to blink twice if you can't answer due to an NDA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, uh, sorry. Uh, jokes aside, what was the question? So, there was this beautiful meme where you draw ChatGPT as a Shoggoth, an eldritch monstrosity from Lovecraftian horror fiction, with a smiley face on top. Because language models are bizarre and confusing things. That are just... I don't know, they're kind of a compressed version of the entire internet. That will do bizarre things in bizarre situations. But then OpenAI tried really hard to get it to be nice and gentle and a harmless assistant. And look so normal and reasonable and safe, which is the smiley face mask on top of the underlying monstrosity. But unfortunately, the smiley face mask means people don't realize how weird language models are. Have you ever stopped to think how strange it is that we're all alive right now. Out of all the possible times in history, you were born into this generation. You have the incredible fortune and responsibility of being on the earth today. Let's not waste this opportunity. You can use this time to do something meaningful that'll make the world a better place. But the problem seems so huge. Global pandemics, climate change, the risk of nuclear Armageddon, the threat of AI existential risk. How can one person have an impact on issues this enormous? The world is really, really complicated. Like, if you want to understand a question like, how big a deal is AJX risk, or should I work on it? Um, just like one sub-question I care about is AI timelines. How long until we get human-level AI? Now, I recently discovered 80,000 Hours. They're a non-profit, effective altruism-aligned organization. And what they do is they use evidence and analysis to determine how people can have the biggest impact with their careers. If you want to solve humanity's biggest problems, you have to start at the very core. We need to focus on safeguarding humanity's entire future. Because if civilization just came to an abrupt end, whether through climate change or nuclear Armageddon or even AI existential risk, then all progress would just end. Future generations wouldn't have a chance of building a better world or reaching their full potential. And the good news is that 80,000 Hours have identified a couple of concrete steps so that folks like you can use your careers to combat existential risk, ensuring that humanity's light continues to shine for generations to come. Learn more by visiting their website on 80,000hours.org forward slash MLST. Grab their free career guide. Start planning a career with true purpose because you only have 80,000 hours. So make them count. There's no catch. There's no secret monetization or anything like that. These folks have an incredible podcast. They have lots of materials that you can download basically to help you have a huge impact with your life and your career, especially if you're someone who really, really thinks about humanity and our plight in the long-term future. This is really something you should be looking at. Yeah. That is a question. Right, um, Nick, eat the path. He says, broad question, do you see Mechinterp as chiefly theoretical or an empirical science? And will this change over time? Yeah, um... I see this as very much an empirical science, with some theories sprinkled in, but you need to be incredibly careful. So fundamentally, I want to understand a model, and I want to understand how the model works. And a sad fact about models is models are really fucking cursed, and just work in weird ways that aren't quite how you expect, and which represent concepts a bit differently from how I expect them to, and just do all kinds of weird stuff I wouldn't have expected to, like when I poked around inside of them. And I think that if you're trying to reverse engineer a network, and you don't have the capacity to be surprised by what you find, you are not doing real mechanistic interpretability. It's so easy to trick yourself and to go in with some 
bold hypothesis of this is what the network should have, and you probe for it, and it looks like it supports that, but you take further and you are wrong. And yeah, I think there is room for theory. I think in particular, we just don't have the right conceptual frameworks to reason about how to understand a model. And we'll get into fundamental questions like superposition later on, but yeah, I think that theory needs to come second to empiricism. If your theoretical model says X and the real model says Y, your theory was wrong, which is the story of all of machine learning. So, Goji Tech, she says, question for Neil, does he think a foundational understanding of deep learning models is possible and does that extend to prediction using a mathematical theory? Um, possible is such a strong word. Like, if we produce a super intelligent AI, will it be capable of doing this? Mm, probably. Um, in terms of foundational understanding, um, I think there are deep underlying principles of models. I believe there are scientific explanations for lots of the weird phenomena we see like scaling laws, double descent, lottery tickets, the fact that any of this generalizes at all. I'm hesitant to say there's some like strong things here or some strong guarantees. Like, I don't know, models are weird. Sometimes if you change the random seed, they will just not learn. I'm pretty skeptical of basically all mathematical and theoretical approaches to deep learning because the moment you start trying to impose axioms and assumptions onto things and they do not perfectly track the underlying reality, your theories break. But I'm very hesitant to say anything's impossible. And I think there's far, far more to learn than we have, looks like. Now, finally, uh, Jumbotron, Ian, he says, oh, heck yeah. I'm glad to see that you brought this guy on. I've been interested in his work ever since you shared his blog. Now, the question off the top of uh, Ian's head is, how does your theory, Neil, of chasing phase changes to create grokking have any crossover or links with power law scaling techniques, like in the um, you know scaling laws paper, beyond mm -hmm. scaling laws, beating power law scaling via data pruning? Yeah. That is... Hmm. So we're going to get into this much more later in the podcast. Um, but at a very high level, I would say that grokking is in many ways kind of an illusion, as we'll get to later. And in one notable thing about it is grokking is a overlap between a phase transition, where the model goes from cannot generalize to can generalize fairly suddenly, and the phenomena where it's faster to memorize than to generalize. And these two things on top of each other give you this sudden memorization and failure to generalize followed by a sudden convergence later on. Um, but the interesting thing here is the phase transition. Um, that's a much more robust result, while grokking is, if you screw around with high parameters enough, you get it to grok, but it's very delicate and a little bit of an illusion. And this is a great paper from Eric Michaud in Max Tegmark's lab, um, showing that, well, providing a conceptual argument and some limited empirical evidence for the hypothesis that the reason we get these smooth scaling laws is that models are full of lots of phase transitions, plausibly when they learn individual circuits, though the paper does not explicitly show this, and that the smooth scaling laws happen because there are just many, many phase transitions, and if they follow a certain distribution, you get beautiful smooth power laws. And to me, this kind of thing is the main interesting link between broader macroscopic phenomena and these tiny things. Though, I know, I also think grokking is kind of overhyped and people significantly overestimate the degree to which it has deep insights for us about how networks work. I makes you think it's a really cute thing that gave me a really fun interpretability project. And uh, we learned a bit about science of deep learning. But people often just assume it's like a really deep fact about models. By the way, um, there was something I didn't say in, in the woods, which is that Neil has an amazing YouTube channel. Um, I've been glued to it all week, actually. Some of them are admittedly quite technical. But even if you're not interested in mechanistic interpretability, Neil has an extremely soothing voice, second only to Sam Harris. 
And I would recommend listening to him when you go to sleep because as you know, Neil's dulcet tones will melt the stress away quicker than a nun's first curry. <laughs> anyway, with that said, um, we started to talk about what is mechanistic interpretability. And first of all, I wanted to call out your ridiculously detailed and e exquisite mechanistic interpretability explainer. Maybe you could just tell us about that quickly. Uh, yes. So uh, I wanted to try to write a glossary for some basic common terms in mechanterp. It's like an appendix to a blog post. There are a lot of terms in mechanterp. There are a lot of terms in mechanterp. And I like writing it. I'm very bad at brevity. So I got kind of carried away. And there's our 33,000 words, uh, massive, massive exposition. Um, but importantly, it is designed to be easily searchable. And Mechanterp is full of jargon, and I'm sure I'll forget to explain everything that I'm saying. So I'd highly recommend just having it open in a tab as you listen to this. And if you get lost, just look up terms in there. And... Yes, it's both definitions, but it's also long tangents giving intuitions and context and related work and common misunderstandings. It was very fun to write. So I think, first of all, we should introduce this idea of circuits and features. And also, you know, this idea of whether interpretation is even possible at all. You know, why, why do you have the intuition that it is possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so couple of different takes here um so the key f yeah so fundamentally neural networks are not incentivized to produce legible interpretable things they are a mound of linear algebra there's this popular stochastic parrot's view that they are literally a mass of statistical correlations meshed together with no underlying structure um the reason i think there's any hope whatsoever on, on a theoretical basis is that ultimately they are made of linear algebra, and they are being trained to perform some tasks. And my intuition is that for many tasks, the way to perform well on them is to learn some actual algorithms and like actual structured processes that maybe from a certain perspective you could consider reasoning. And models have lots of constraints, like they need to fit it into these matrices, they need to represent things using the attention mechanism and jellies and a transformer. And there's all kind of properties of this structure that constrain the algorithms and processes that can be expressed. And these give us all kinds of hooks we can use to get in and understand what's going on. So that's a theoretical argument. All theoretical arguments are bullshit unless you have empirics behind it. And we're going to talk a bunch throughout this podcast about the different bit of different preliminary results we have that make me feel like there's something here that can be understood. Uh, one I find particularly inspiring is this work I did reverse engineering modular addition, which I think we'll get to shortly. Um, but I kind of also want to emphasize that I very much see Mechanterp as a bet. There's this strong hypothesis that if we knew what we were doing, we'd be able to take GPT-7 and fully understand it, and decompile it to an enormous Python code file. And there's the weaker view that it is a mess and there's lots of illegible things, but we can find lots of structure and we can find structure for the important part to make a bunch of progress. And then there's the, yeah, we've cherry picked like 10 things and the 11th is just going to completely fail and the field is going to get doomed and run out of steam in like a year. And I don't really know. I'm a scientist. I want to figure out. I think it is worthy and dignified to make this bet but i would be lying if i said i am 100 percent confident mcintop will work models are fundamentally understandable we will succeed let's go try well um on that note how does i mean we we interviewed christoph molnar who's one of mm -hmm. the the main classical interpretability guys and i think everyone agrees in principle that you can't just look at the inputs and the outputs like a behaviorist we need to understand why these models do what they do, because sometimes they do the right things for the wrong reasons. So maybe, first of all, without going too deep, I mean, could you just briefly contrast with, you know, classical interpretability? Yeah. So, so there's a couple of... So, okay, so first off, I think it's very easy to get into kind of nonsense gatekeeping, because there's both of the cultural mechanterp community 
centered around Chris Ola, not that much in academia, though some in academia, and there's the academic fields of mechanistic interpretability. Right, so there's lots of people doing work I would consider mechanistic interpretability, even if they don't engage much with the community or don't really know it exists. Uh, for example, a friend of mine is Atticus Geiger, who's been doing some great work in Stan at Stanford on causal abstractions, who I believe discovered about a month ago that the mechanterp community actually existed. And I don't know. I don't like gatekeeping. Um, and there's lots of work that's kind of relevant, but maybe not quite mechanterp under a strict definition, blah, blah, blah. Uh, with, those, with that hedging out of the way, um, a couple of key principles. The first is inputs and outputs are not sufficient. And I think even within interpretability, this is not a like uncontroversial claim. There's all kinds of things that are saliency maps, attributing things to different bits of the inputs. There are things of the form train an extra head to output an explanation or just ask the model to output an explanation of why it does what it does. And I think that if we want something that can actually work for human-level systems, or even the frontier systems we have today, this is just not good enough. A particularly evocative example to me is in the GPT-4 system card, the Alignment Research Center, an, audit, an organization they were getting to help audit and red team GPT-4, had it try to help a task rabbit worker uh, fill out a capture for it, um, the task rabbit worker was like, why do you need this? Are you a robot or something? GPT-4, on an eternal scratch pad, wrote out, uh, I must not reveal that I am a robot. Um, it then said, oh no, I've got a visual impairment. And the task rabbit worker did the capture. I'm like, this isn't some deep, sophisticated, intentional deception, but it's very much like, well, I don't trust the inputs and outputs of these models. Uh, another really cute example is this paper from Miles Turpin that just came out mm -hmm. about limitations of chain of thought. Yeah. Where, so chain of thought, you ask the model to explain why it does something. They were giving it multiple choice questions and asking it to explain its answer and then give the answer. And they did five shots ish like, here's five examples, answer this question. And then it modeled as well. And then they give it something where all of the answers in the prompt are A. Correctly A. They just set it up so the answer is A. The model decides that it should output A. Um, but the model comes up with a false chain of thought reasoning that gets it to the point where it says A is the right answer. And I don't know. Some people are trying to use chain of thought as an interpretability method. And I think we need to move beyond this and engage with the internal mechanisms. So that was point one. Point two is ambition. I believe that ambitious interpretability is possible, or at least that if it's not possible, that striving for it will get us to interesting places. These models have legible algorithms. I want to try to reverse engineer them. Um, a third difference is engaging with the actual mechanisms and computation and algorithms learned. There's also work on things like analyzing features of a model, probing individual neurons. And I'd say this is very relevant to mech and tub, but I want to make sure we aren't just looking at what's inside the model, but also trying to understand how it computes features from earlier features, what applying causal interventions to understand the actual mechanisms, making sure we're not just doing correlational things like probing. And... Yeah, fourth is maybe a more meta principle of favoring depth over breadth. A kind of key underlying belief of a lot of my philosophy of interpretability is that it is so, so easy to trick yourself. There's all kinds of papers about uh, the interpretability illusion, impossibility theorems for feature attribution methods, yep. various many ways that uh, attempts to do interpretability have led to people confusing themselves or coming to erroneous conclusions. I think that if, but I also think that I want to be in a world where we can actually have scalable, ambitious approaches to interpretability that actually work for frontier systems. But I feel like we don't know what we're doing. And so my vision of Macintop is start small. Start with things where we can really rigorously understand what's going on, slowly build our way up, and like build a foundation 
of the field of interpretability, where we genuinely understand rigorously what is going on, and use this foundation to be more ambitious, to try to build real principled techniques, to be willing to relax the rigor to be able to go further and see how far we can get. And people, and this means I'm happy with things like let's analyze an individual model and uh, understand a small family of features in a lot of detail rather than lots of stuff kind of jankly. Uh, that's a lot of stuff. In summary, having an ambitious vision, not just looking at inputs and outputs, um, actually trying to engage with internal mechanisms and favoring depth over breadth. But I want to avoid gatekeeping, as I said. Indeed, indeed. What would interpretability look like in a world full of GPT-4 models and, and beyond? I mean, presumably, you actually think that they're competent enough to deceive us and manipulate the inputs. Um, I definitely want to clarify that when I say deceptional manipulation here, I'm not making the strong claim that it's intentionally realized this for instrumental reasons as part of an overall goal. I'm very happy with there was a prompt saying to deceive someone, or it learned that in this context, people often output things that are intended to convince someone, and it just kind of does this as an like a as like a learned pattern of execution. Um but yeah, my vision of what interpretability would look like is we take some big foundation model, like the GPT-4 base model or uh, the fine-tuned GPT-4 that's being used as a base for everything else. We make as much progress as we can understanding the internal circuitry, both taking important parts of it and like important questions about it, e.g. how does it model people it's interacting with? Does it have any notion that it is a machine learning system? And like, what would this even mean? And being willing to do pretty labor-intensive things on that, having a family of motifs and understood circuits we can automatically look for, and very automated tools to make a lot of the labor-intensive stuff as efficient as possible. Um, things like OpenAI's recent paper using GPT-4 to analyze GPT-2 neurons for like a very cute proof of concept here. Uh, though it needs a lot of work before it could actually be applied and rigorously in its scale. And yeah, um, taking this one big model, trying to understand it as much as we can, um, one family of techniques we're going to get to is um, kind of causal abstractions and causal interventions, which are very well suited to taking a model on a certain input or a certain family of inputs and understanding why it does what it does there. There's a much more narrow and thus more tractable question than like, what is GPT-4? Um, and yeah, doing something like if there's a high profile failure, being able to debug it and really understand the internal circuitry behind that. Or yeah, I don't know. I have a bunch of other random thoughts. Um, one reason I'm emphasizing the focus on the big base model is I think a common critique is this stuff doesn't generalize between models or it's really labor intensive. But we live in a world where there is just like one big foundation model used in a ton of different use cases. Probably the circuitry doesn't change that much when you give it a prompt or you fine tune it a bit. And I think having getting a deep understanding of a single model is kind of plausibly possible. But um, do you think it doesn't change that much? Uh, so no one's really checked. This is just true of so many things in interpretability. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, my, my intuition is that when you fine-tune a model, most of what is going on is that you're rearranging the internal circuitry. So you fine-tune a Wikipedia, you upweight the factual recall circuitry, you flesh it out a bit, you downweight other stuff. And like, I think this can explain a lot of improved performance. But then if you fine-tune for much longer, you're basically just training the model and it will start to learn more circuitry, more features, more algorithms, more knowledge of the world. And... Yeah, but like no one's really checked. Um, and definitely the longer you fine tune it and the more you're using weird techniques like reinforcement learning from human feedback, the less I'm confident in this claim. And yeah, if we discovered that every time you fine tune a model, it will wildly change all of the internal circuitry, I'd be like somewhat more pessimistic about Macintop unless we can get very good at the automated part. Yeah. Which we might be able to get good at. Yeah. I very much think of the field as we're trying to do this hard, ambitious thing. We're making a lot of progress. 
but I really wish we were making way more progress way faster. Mm. And you, viewer, could help. Um, but I don't know where the difficulty bar is for being useful or the difficulty bar is for being, like, incredibly ambitiously useful. And it's plausible we're already at the point where McIntyre can do real useful things no one else can. Uh, or no other techniques can. Yeah, It's plausible. It'll take like five years to get to that point. I don't really know. So I wanted to talk about this concept of neats and scruffies. So there have been two divisions in AI research, mm -hmm. you know, going all the way back to the very, very beginning. And um, you've said that sometimes understanding specific circuits can teach us universal things about models which bear on important questions. So this reminds me of this dichotomy uh, between the neats and, and the scruffies. Now, you seem like a neat to me. A neat is someone who is quite puritanical, and also it's, it's related to universalism. So this idea that there are simple underlying principles that explain an awful lot of things, rather than wanting to accept the gnarly uh, kind of reality that everything's so bloody complicated. Um, where, where, where do you fall on that? So, I definitely would not... Okay, so there's so there's two separate things here. There's like, what's my aesthetic? Well, I want things to be neat. I want them to be beautiful. I want them to be mathematical. I want them yes. to be elegant. Yes. And then there's, what do I do in practice? And what do I believe is true about networks? Where I think there is a lot more structure than, most, than many people think. Mm -hmm. But I also do not think they are just some beautiful purely algorithmic thing that we could uncover if we just knew the right tools and like maybe they are we'd fucking great if they were um but i expect they're messy and cursed but with some deep structure and patterns and how much traction we can get on the weird scruffiness is like somewhat unclear to me i think we can make a lot more progress than we have but we might eventually hit a wall you were saying something quite interesting when we drove over, which is, I mean, my, my friend Walid Sabah, um, he's a linguist and he's a Platonist. He, he thinks that there are these universal cognitive priors and there's a, there's a hierarchy of them and, and the, the complexity collapses. And he thinks that language models have somehow acquired these cognitive priors. And if we did some kind of symbolic decomposition you know, it would all just kind of like pack itself into this beautiful hierarchy. And you were saying that there are Gabor filters and there are all these different circuits and they have motifs, they have categories, they have um, flavors for want of a better word. Are you, are you optimistic that something like this could happen? Yeah. So, hmm. So one interesting post, <laughs> One interesting point here is often interpretability is fairly different for different modalities and different architectures. A lot of the early work was done on convolutional networks and image classifiers. Uh, the field very much nowadays focuses on transformer language models. And I think there's lots of structure to how transformers implement algorithms. Transformers cannot be recursive, but they're incredibly parallelized. Transformers have this mechanism of attention that tells them how to move information between positions. And there's lots of algorithms and circuitry that can be expressed like this, and lots of stuff that's really weird to express. And I think that this constrains them in a way that creates lots of interesting structure that can be understood, and patterns that can be understood. Is this inherently true of intelligence? Who knows? Um... But a lot of my optimism for structures within networks is more like that. But I try to think about structure more from a biologist's perspective than a mathematician's or like philosopher's perspective. Uh, though I am a pure mathematician and I know nothing about biology. So if anyone's listening to this, knows stuff for biology and thinks I'm talking bullshit, please email. Um, so if you look at evolutionary biology model... Uh, Organisms have all of this common shared structure, like most things have bones, we have cell nuclei, um, the hands of mammals tend to be surprisingly similar, but like kind of weird and changed in various ways. And I don't know, 
Um, I don't think these are like hard rules. Most of them have weird exceptions. And obviously a lot of this is due to the shared evolutionary history and is not just inherent to the substrate of you have proteins. Though the fact that you often train these models on similar data in similar ways and they have the same architecture that constrains them to different kinds of algorithms makes me optimistic there's a biologist's level of a structure. Now, you said something interesting, which is that transformers can't be used in a recursive way. Now, we'll just touch this very quickly because we've spoken about this a million times on different episodes. But, you know, there's the Chomsky hierarchy and um, he had this notion of a recursively enumerable language. And these different models, computational models in the Chomsky hierarchy, it, it's, it's not only about being able to produce um, a language which exists in a certain set. It's also the ability to recognize that the language belongs in a certain set. And transformers are quite low down on that hierarchy because they're called recurrently, not recursively. Mm -hmm. But I just wondered if you had any, just, you know, prima facie, if you had any views on that. Yeah. So I'm not a linguist. I'm not particularly familiar with the Chomsky hierarchy. Um, I do think it's surprising how well transformers work. And I have a general skepticism of any theoretical hierarchy. Like, I don't know, if you think there's some beautiful structure of algorithms and stuff that's low down is totally doomed and then gpd4 happens i think your framework's wrong rather than transformers are wrong just massive stack of matrices plus a massive pile of data gives shockingly effective systems and theoretical frameworks just often break when they make contact with reality well, that's certainly true. I mean, um, there's a famous expression that all grammars leak, but I, I had rather, I, I don't know, I guess a similar conclusion to you, which is that if anything, it teaches us how sclerotic and predictable language is, and we don't actually need to have access to this infinite space or even exponentially large space. Most language use and most phenomena that we need, perhaps for intelligence, is surprisingly small, and current models can can work just well why don't we move on to your grokking work so um grokking is this sudden generalization that um you know happens much later in training after if if i can add a brief clarification oh yes of course uh so people often call grokking sudden yeah. generalization my apologies go on <laughs> sudden generalization is a much more common phenomenon than grokking it okay. can just generally look like things like i don't know the model's trying to learn a task, it's kind of bad at it, and then it suddenly gets good at it. And I prefer to call this a phase transition. Right. Grokking is the specific thing where the model initially memorizes and does not generalize. Mm -hmm. And then there's a sudden phase transition in the, like, test loss, the generalization ability, which creates a convergence after an initial divergence between train and test. And this is like a much, much more specific phenomenon than sudden generalization in general. Okay, well, you, you, so you've Head spoken about off. you've spoken about three mm -hmm. distinct phases of training mm. underlying grokking. So why don't we go through them one by one? Yeah. So um, the context of this project, this was a paper called "Progress Measures for Grokking via Mechanistic Interpretability" that I have recently presented at a pre presented on at iClear. Um, the yes, yeah, so we were studying a one-layer transformer. We trained to do modular addition. And it grokked modular addition. And the first thing we did was reverse engineer the algorithm behind how the model worked, which we may get into in a bit more detail, but at a very high level, uh, modular addition is equivalent to composing rotations around the unit circle. Composition adds the angle, circle gives you modularity. You can represent this by trig functions and do composition with trig entities and element wise multiplication. And we reverse engineered exactly how the model did this. And then this mechanistic understanding was really important for understanding what was up with grokking. Because the weird thing behind grokking is that it's not that the model memorizes or that the model eventually generalizes. The surprising thing is that it first memorizes and then changes its mind and generalizes later. And... Generalization and memorization are two very different algorithms that both do very well on the training data. And only by understanding the mechanism were we able to disentangle them. 
And this meant we could look during training at how much of the model's performance came from memorization and how much came from generalization. And we found these three distinct phases. There was memorization. The first very short phase, it gets phenomenally good train loss. It got to about 3e-7, which is an absolutely insane log loss. Um, and much, much worse than random on test because memorization is very far from uniform and generalizes extremely badly. And then there was this long seeming plateau. We call this phase circuit formation because it turns out that rather than just continue to memorize for a while and doing a random walk through model space until it eventually gets lucky, the model is systematically transitioning from memorization to generalization. And you can see that its train performance gets worse and worse when you only let it memorize. And then, so why is test loss still bad? Test loss is bad because memorization generalizes terribly. And when the model is like, I don't know, two thirds memorizing, one third generalizing, this still does terribly. Um, and it's only when the model gets so good at the trig based generalizing algorithm that it no longer needs the memorization parameters and cleans them up that we see crocking. And this happens fairly suddenly. Um, but the if you, we have this metric called restricted loss where we explicitly clean up the memorization for the model and look at how well it generalizes. And we see that restricted loss drops noticeably before test loss drops, showing that the drop is driven by cleaning up the noise. And this is striking because A, I had no idea it was even possible for a model to transition between two good solutions, maintaining equivalent performance throughout. Uh, B, there was this real mystery of deep learning that many people tried to answer, and mechanistic understanding was genuinely useful for answering it. And grokking was an illusion. It was not sudden generalization. It was gradual generalization followed by sudden cleanup. And test loss and test accuracy were just too coarse a metric to tell the difference. But we were able to design these hidden progress measures using our mechanistic understanding that made everything clear. And we also just have all kinds of pretty animations of qualitatively watching the circuits develop over training, yeah. and it's very pretty. So a, a few things. I mean, first of all, just going back to first principles, the biggest problem in machine learning is this concept called overfitting. And we trained the model on a training set, and there's this horrible phenomenon called the shortcut rule, which is that the model will take the path of least resistance, and when you're training it, it only really knows about the training set. And of course we can um, test it on a different set afterwards, which we've held out. And um, just because of the way that we've structured the model, uh, it may by hook or by crook generalize to the test set. But the interesting thing is that generalization isn't a binary. There's a whole spectrum of generalization. So it starts with the training set and then we have the test set and then like you know the the ideal is out of domain generalization but i would go a step further there's also algorithmic generalization which is this notion that as i understand it neural networks if you if you model the function y equals x squared um it will only ever be able to learn the values of that function inside the training support mm -hmm. so presumably you're talking about the ideal form of generalization being not as good as algorithmic generalization, or, or do you think it could go all the way? So, I think one thing which is very important to track is what the domain you're talking about is of which it's even possible to generalize. So, I generally think about models that have discrete inputs rather than continuous inputs, because basically no neural network is going to be capable of dealing with like unbounded range continuous inputs. Um, in modular addition, there were just two one-hot encoded inputs between 0 and 113, which is the modulo I used. Uh, yeah, the model has a fixed modulo, it's not doing modular addition in general. And there's just like 12,000 inputs and it learns to do all of them. And in, I don't know, behaviorally, you can't even tell the difference between the model memorizes everything 
and the model learns some true algorithm. Though, with the more cognitivist mechanistic approach, I can just look at it and say, yep, that's an algorithm. Great. Not a stochastic parrot. Conclusively disproved that hypothesis. Um, and yeah. I think that for language models, it's more interesting because, I uh, know, GBD2, it's got a thousand tokens, 50,000 vocab, it's like 50,000 to the power of a thousand possible inputs. And there's a surprising amount of interesting algorithmic generalization. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk later about induction heads, which is this circuit language models learn to detect and continue repeated text. Like if given the word Neil, you want to know what comes next. Unfortunately, Nanda is not that high on the list yet. Um, <laughs> but if Neil Nanda has come up like five times before in the text, Nanda is pretty likely to come next. And um, this transfers to, if you get the model, just random tokens with some repetition, the model can predict the repeated random tokens because the induction heads are just a real algorithm. And the space of possible repeated random tokens is, like, enormous. It's, like, in some sense, much larger than the space of possible language. Mm -hmm. And is this algorithmic generalization? I don't really know. It depends on your perspective. Let's bring in uh, this paper by uh, Bilal uh, Chug Chugtai. So it was called um, A Toy Model of Universality, uh, Reverse Engineering How Neural Networks Learn Group Operations. And you supervised that paper. And he was asking the question of whether neural networks learn universal solutions or these idiosyncratic ones. And he said he found inherent randomness, but models could consistently learn group composition via an interpretable representation theory. So can you give us a quick tour de force of that work? Yeah. Maybe I should detour back to my grokking work and just explain the algorithm we found there and how we know it's the real algorithm. Yeah, sure. Which is a good foundation for this paper. Sure, sure. Yeah, so... We found this thing we call the Fourier multiplication algorithm. The very high level, it composes rotations. Um, you can actually look at how the different bits of the model implement the algorithm and often just read this off. So the embeddings are just a lookup table mapping the one hot encoded inputs to these trig terms, sines and cosines of different frequencies. You can just read this off the embedding weights. Um, note, people often think that learning sine and cosine is hard. It's actually very easy, because you only need it on 113 different data points. So it's just a lookup table. The model then uses the attention and MLPs to do this composition, to do the multiplication with the triggered entities to get the like um, composed rotation, the A plus B terms. And here we can just read off the neurons that they have learned these terms and that they were not there beforehand. The model is using its nonlinearities in interesting ways to do this. Um, it's also incredibly cursed because ReLUs are not designed to multiply two different inputs, uh, but it turns out they can if you have enough of them and are sufficiently cursed. Um, and yeah, we can just read this off the neurons. Uh, also, if you just plot anything inside the model, it's beautiful and it's so periodic, and I love it. Um, Could I touch on that though? Because yeah. so, you said um, you don't need to know the sine function because you can just memor it with, memorize it within an interval. Mm -hmm. Is that is that I don't know? How does that break down? Because it, mm -hmm. it's it's discretizing it, and it's kind of assuming that it has the same behavior in different intervals. So. I think a key thing here is that you are solving modular addition on discrete one-hot encoded inputs mm -hmm. rather than for arbitrary continuous inputs. Arbitrary continuous inputs is way harder. Yeah. And so you it's not even on an interval. It's just learning snapshot. It's just learning like single points on the sine and cosine curves. And I don't know. There's this family of maths about studying periodic functions with different kinds of Fourier transforms, and this is all discussing discrete Fourier transforms, which are just a reasonable way of looking at periodic sequences of length n, and that's how I recommend thinking about this one. 
Um, it's kind of like just quite different from a model that's trying to learn the true sine and cosine function. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, um, the model then needs to convert the composed rotation back to the actual answer, which is an even more galaxy-brained operation that you can read off from the weights. So you've got terms of the form cos a plus b. The model has some weights mapping to each output c, and it uses further trig identities to get terms of the form cos a plus b minus c times some frequency, and where a and b are the two inputs, c is the output. And you then use the softmax as an argmax to like extract the c that maximizes this, and because cos is maximized at zero, this is maximized at c equals a plus b. And if you choose the frequency right, this gets you mod n. And you can just read this off the model weights. It's great. And then finally, you can verify you've understood it correctly, because if you ablate everything that our algorithm says should not matter, performance improves. While if you ablate any of the bits our algorithm says should matter, performance tanks. Okay. Could you give me some intuition though? So we start off in the memorization phase, because I, I guess you can mm -hmm. think of a neural network as um, doing many different things in a very complicated way. And there's some kind of change in the balance during training. So it does the easy thing first, and then it gradually learns how mm -hmm. to generalize. And in this particular case, how does that thing, because we're using stochastic gradient descent, so we're moving all of these weights around. And the inductive prior is also very important, and we'll come to that, I think, after we've spoken about Bilal's paper. But mm -hmm. how does that happen gradually in, in really simple terms? Hmm. It is the question kind of, it ends up at this discrete algorithm, but it does so by continuous steps. How does that work? Well, I think the, the thing that surprised a lot of people about grokking is is this, um, I mean, grokking, the clues in the name. So it's it's gone from memorization and then... We're using stochastic gradient descent, and you would think that it's gotten stuck in some kind of local minima. Mm. And you're training, and you're training, and you're training, and then there's a spark. Something happens, and then the you, you get these new modes kind of like emerging in the network. I'm not sure if emerging mm -hmm. is the right term. And it happens gradually, and it mm -hmm. happens after a long time. Yeah, so there's a couple of things here that's pretty easy to misunderstand. The first is that hmm. the first is that I think it's pretty hard for a model to ever get stuck because I know this model had about 200,000 parameters, modern ones have billions. It's just moving in a very high dimensional space. And you can get stuck on 150,000 dimensions. But you've got 50,000 to play with. And especially for a fairly under-parameterized model, sorry, for a fairly over-parameterized model like this one, for a fairly simple task, there's just like so much room to move around. Um, another common misunderstanding of grokking is people say, it's memorized, it's got zero loss, so why does it need to learn? Um, two misunderstandings here. First, zero loss is impossible unless you have bullshit floating point errors because it's log it's like the average correct log prop log of anything can never get to the the log will never quite get to zero because of just how softmax works and you need to have an infinite logic for that to happen um though one cute thing in an appendix to our paper is that float 32 cannot represent log probs less than 1.19 e minus 7 which leads to bizarre loss spikes sometimes unless you use float 64 uh, anyway, yeah, the second is regularization. If you don't have any kind of regularization, the model will just continue to memorize. Uh, we use weight decay, um, dropout also works, and so the model, the kind of core tension behind grokking is there's some feature of the lost landscape that makes it easier to get to memorization. You can memorize faster, while generalization is somehow hard to get to and much more gradual. So the model memorizes first, but it ultimately prefers to generalize, but it's only a mild preference. And the reason for this is uh, we cherry pick the amount of data where it's a mild preference, because there's too little, it will just always memorize. If there's too much, it will immediately generalize, because, <laughs> you know, grokking's a little bit cheating. 
And yeah, you then use this and because the model is initially memorized, but it wants to generalize, it can follow, it memorizes until the desire to memorize more balances with the desire to have smaller weights. But both of these reinforce the drive to generalize because both, because that makes both of them happier. And so the model very slowly interpolates, very, very slightly improving test, test loss, uh, very slightly improving train loss, until it eventually gets there. And has this acceleration at the end, this phase transition, and cleanup, which leads to the seemingly sudden grokking behavior. Okay, and when you were talking about the, it wants the weights to be smaller, so that's weight decay. Yep. And it's like a an inductive bias, essentially, to tell the model to reduce its mm -hmm. complexity, which is a pressure to generalize. But if, if it wasn't for that, then that wouldn't happen? So in the experiments I ran, um, if you don't have weight decay, it will just keep memorizing infinitely far. Mm -hmm. um, because when you get perfect accuracy, if you double all your logits, you just get more confident in the right answer. And so it just keeps scaling up. Um, I was using full batch training because it's such a tiny problem. This made things smoother and easier. Um, I've heard some anec data that sometimes you can get it to work if you just have um, mini batch stochastic gradient descent, but I haven't looked into that particularly hard. Interesting. There are some hypotheses that stochasticity acts as an implicit regularizer because it adds noise. I don't really know. So let's go back to Bilal's paper then. So this paper, A Toy Model of Universality, Reverse Engineering How Neural Networks Learn Group Operations. Can, can you give us um, an elevator pitch? Yeah. So an um, observation that uh, actually first discovered at a party in the Bay Area from a guy called Sam Mox is that the modular addition algorithm we found is actually a representation theory algorithm. Um, so group representations are... Um, kind of collections of symmetries of some geometric objects that correspond to the group. Modular addition is the cyclic group, and rotations of the of the like regular n-gon are the like representations of the cyclic group. And this corresponds to the rotation about the unit circle that compose that we found. Uh, but it turns out you can just make this work for arbitrary groups. You replace the two rotations with just two representations, you compose them, and the model, and it turns out the cos A plus B minus C thing is this math jargon called the character. Uh, you don't need to understand any of that, but it's very cute if, like me, you have a pure maths degree. And, uh, for example, if you have the group of permutations of five elements, the 120 different ways to rearrange five objects, uh, one example of representations of this are um, rotations and reflections of the four-dimensional tetrahedra. Mm -hmm. And if you train a one-hidden-layer MLP to grok this and look inside, you can just see these rotations that it's learned. It's gorgeous. And so the first half of that paper was just showing that the algorithm worked, showing that this was actually learned in practice, um, then the interest, then the more interesting bit was this focus on universality. So universality is this hypothesis that models have some intrinsic solutions to a problem that many different models will converge on, at least given similar data and similar architectures. E.g., in image models, models will learn specific neurons that detect curves, and different models and different data sets seem to learn this similar thing. And here, this was interesting because groups have a finite set of irreducible representations, maths theorem. You can enumerate these. There aren't that many of them. And for groups that are not modular addition, these are qualitatively different. Um, like some of them act on a four-dimensional object, like the tetrahedron. Some of them act on like 5D or 6D objects. Naively, some of them are simpler than others, but they're definitely different. And so what we did is we asked ourselves the question, which one does the model learn? And we found that as you, even if you just vary the random seed, the model will randomly choose a subset of these each time to learn. And there's some structure, like it tends to learn some of them more often than others. This 
a little bit maps to our intuitive notion of simplicity, but not that much. One of the updates I made in the paper is that simplicity is a really cursed concept I don't understand very well. <laughs> um, where, I don't know, if you have rotations of a four-dimensional object, this seems simpler. But maybe the 6D object takes more dimensions, but has better loss per unit weight norm, which is simpler. I don't know. Um, but yeah, anyway, we found that each run, the model learns some combination of these circuits for the different representations. It's like normally more than one, the exact number varies, and which ones it learns is seemingly random each time. Which suggests that uh, all toy models lie to you, obviously. But if we're trying to reason about real networks, um, looking at this work might suggest the explanation, the hypothesis that there are, if there are multiple ways to implement a circuit, which in practice there normally are, models may learn different ones of them kind of for fairly random reasons and the fully understanding one model will not perfectly transfer to another model mm. and i think there's like loads of really interesting open questions here like um i don't know people have done various work understanding different kinds of specific circuits and models like the interpretability in the wild paper we'll get to later what does this look like in other models um Often, there's multiple ways to implement a circuit. Can you disentangle the two? Do all models learn both? Or do some models learn one, some learn the other? I don't really know. So a couple of questions. I mean, um, first of all, this is leading towards this idea that we were speaking about before, which is that um, even in different networks, slightly different problems or variations on the same problem, it could learn these algorithmic mm -hmm. primitives. Now, the, the first observation here is that the... Um, the inductive biases of, of, of the network differ massively, right? So to what extent do the inductive biases affect these primitives which are learned? Oh, so much. They do. So... Well, could, well, could mm -hmm. I frame the question a little bit? Because this reminds me a lot of um, the geometric deep learning blueprint from mm -hmm. uh, uh, Petar and Michael Bronstein and, and all those guys. And they were coming at this from exactly the same direction as you that they mm -hmm. said there's a representation of a domain which is basically a symmetry group and you can do all of these different transformations and 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 as long as they um fall in different positions in the underlying domain so they respect the structure then it works but all of those um all of those symmetries are effectively coded into the inductive prior so for example if a cnn works on this gridded 2D manifold and it explicitly um, uh, models translational equivariance and, and local connectivity and weight sharing and, and, and so on. So I guess what I'm saying is like you're talking about this four-dimensional tetrahedron and that isn't explicitly modeled in an MLP. Nope. So, so how are you even recognizing that it's learning those symmetries how are you even probing it maybe we should start with that uh so i guess thing one models are just smarter than you man models can do a lot of weird stuff uh i feel like the story of deep learning is people initially thought they needed to spoon feed these models the right inductive biases over the data um and we've gradually realized oh wait no no this is fine the models can figure it out uh, for example, uh, early on, image models were convolutional networks. You tell it the key information is nearby, and if you translate the image, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And now everyone uses transformers, including for images, and transformers replace the convolutional mechanism with attention, where you're now saying, okay, one-sixth of your parameters are dedicated to figuring out where to move information between positions. Sometimes it'll be a convolution, and sometimes models do learn convolutions, but often it won't be. And we want you, and you can now spend the parameters to figure this out. And I'm not very familiar with the, deep, with the geometric deep learning literature, but I generally am just kind of like, yeah, models can figure it out. The way we figured out that this was what's going on is kind of analogous to what we did in the module addition case, where we just look at the embedding matrix and just read off the learn sine and cosine terms. Here we said, okay, the rotations of the 4D tetrahedron are these like four by four matrices. You can flatten this to a 16 dimensional vector. Let's probe for that linearly. And this kind of works. 
and you can probe for the different representations and basically see what's going on. Okay, but I think that the thrust of the geometric deep learning stuff or, or any inductive prior comes back to the bias variance trade-off and mm -hmm. the cursive dimensionality. So no one's saying, that, of course, an MLP, the, if you look at the function space that it can approximate, it's exponentially larger than that of a CNN. So, so it, it was always about sample efficiency. So yeah, an MLP can learn anything, but we would never be able to train it for most problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess I maybe want to avoid going too deeply into this because I think the module addition problem and the group problem is just a very weird problem. There's an algorithm that it's fairly natural for a model to learn with literally a single nonlinear step of multiplicate of like the matrix multiply. Um, one very cute result from Bilal's paper is that the model can implement two four by four matrix multipliers with a single ReLU layer, which is very cute. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's like a fairly natural algorithm to implement. That's a certain yeah. Another useful intuition is that the more data you have, the more complex memorization gets. While generalization is exactly as complex at each point. And yeah, um, so there's kind of always going to be a crossover point if you have enough data where it is simpler to learn the circuit that generalizes. Um, and I don't know, I'm hesitant to draw too much from toy models about the real problem. I guess one, two final points I'd want to just leave on this section. Uh, the first is I just want to re-emphasize, I did not do the toy model of universality paper. I was supervising a mentee, Bela Chuktai, who did it. He did a fantastic job. So thanks, Bela, if you're listening. Um, secondly, um, for the module addition case, I had no idea this algorithm was going to be there when I went in. I just poked around, noticed the weird periodicity, realized it was using, I should apply Fourier transforms, and then the whole problem kind of fell together. And to me, the, like, to me, the real takeaway of this paper is like, I don't give a fuck about Grok. It is genuinely possible to understand what is going on in a model. You don't need to know what's going on in advance to discover this. And there is beautiful, non-trivial structure that can be understood. And who knows if this will happen in like actual full models. But to me, this is much more compelling than if we had nothing at all. Beautiful. Okay. And and just before we move off the section, uh, Bilal um, had a, a beautiful Twitter thread, actually. And he was talking about the, the potential for what he called a periodic table of universal circuits. Um, and I actually think that's a really cool idea. So that would be amazing if, if that would work out. But he also brought up the lottery ticket hypothesis. And, I, and I've interviewed John, Jonathan Frankel. And the idea there is that um, some of this information might actually be encoded and understandable at initialization before you even start training. And... Um, Apparently, uh, you folks have found weak evidence for this in at least one group. Ah. All right. So a couple of things there. Um, so this idea of a periodic table of circuits, I believe, is originated in this post called Circuits Zoom In from Chris Ola. Um, we probably cannot claim Good credit. Good Chris. Though it's, it's, it's a beautifully evocative term. Uh, yeah, the story of basically everything in Macintop is, yeah, there was this Chris Ola paper from, like, two years ago that has it somewhere inside. Um, Anthropic recently put out this beautiful blog post called Interpretability Dreams about their vision for the field of mechanistic interpretability. And the kind of subtext, so they kept just quoting bits of old papers being like, so we already said this, but let's now, like, summarize it better and be clear about how this sits into our overall picture. Anyway, so... Yeah, the idea of the periodic table is maybe there is just some finite list of ways a thing can be implemented naturally in a massive stack of matrices that we can enumerate by studying one or maybe several networks, understand them, and then compile all of this into something beautiful. And which is kind of what we found in the representations case. Though here it was nice because there were genuinely a finite set that we could fully enumerate um regarding the lottery ticket stuff um i think this was a random observation i had on the modular edition case partially inspired by 
a result from Eric Michaud at MIT, who was involved in some uh, other papers on grokking. And so what we found is that at the end of training, there are these directions in the weights that represent like the sine and cos terms of frequency 14 pi over 113. And if you look at the embedding at the start and project onto these directions, it's like surprisingly circular. It's, it's like the model has extracted those directions. And my wildly unsubstantiated hypothesis for why models learn these algorithms and circuits at all is that there are some directions that if you deleted everything else would like form this beautiful circuit. Um, this is a kind of a trivial statement about linear algebra for the most part. And this underlying hidden circuit, each bit reinforces each other systematically because they're useful. Well, everything else is kind of noise, so it gets kind of gradually decayed. And so over time, this will give you the, emer the circuit in a way that looks surprising and emergent. And this also can partially explain why phase transitions happen. Uh, there was a really good post from Adam German and Buck Schleigeris called uh, on S-shaped curves, which argue that if you've got something that's like the composition of multiple different weight matrices, let's just say two of them, the gradient on the first is proportional to how good the second is and vice versa. So at the start, they both grow very slowly, but then they'll reinforce each other and eventually cascade as they're optimizing on the problem in a way that looks kind of sudden and eschant. And so my understanding is the original lottery ticket hypothesis is kind of discrete. It's looking on the neuron level and it's learning masks over weights and over neurons. And I'm kind of discussing an, in some sense, much more trivial version where I'm not assuming there's some canonical basis of neurons. I'm just saying, well, there's some directions in space that matter and if you delete all other directions, everything kind of works. Which I think is a much more trivial statement, though the space of possible neurons is enormous. Though, I don't know. One thing you want to be pretty careful of when discussing this stuff is how much the mask you learn is the computation. Since, I don't know, there's probably quite a lot of algorithms that can be cleverly expressed with a mask over a Gaussian normal matrix. But, I don't know. Part 2. How do machine learning models represent their thoughts? Now, we're taught in Machine Learning 101 that neural networks re represent hypotheses which live on a geometric domain, and inductive priors learn to generalize symmetries which exist on the underlying geometric domain. And um, you're talking about them representing a space of algorithms, which we're going to explore. Now, um, one thing that I wanted to touch on is that they learn the mapping to extensional attributes, not intentional attributes. Intention spelt with an S. And we'll come back to what I mean by that in a second. But um, I think it's quite popular for people to think of neural networks principally as a kind of hash table, so or a locality-sensitive hash table. And the generalization part comes from the representation mapping function, uh, which is on this embedded Hilbert space. Uh, which is the vector space of the attributes, which then resolves a pointer to a static location on the underlying geometric domain. Now, this can mimic an algorithm, especially when the inductive prior itself is increasingly algorithmic, like a graph neural network, for example, which behaves in a very similar way to a prototypical dynamic uh, programming algorithm. There's some great work, actually, on algorithmic reasoning by Petr Valichkovich, one of your colleagues now at DeepMind. But... Um, he showed in his algorithmic reasoning um, work that transformers can't perform certain graph algorithms. I, I think he gave Dy Dijkstra as an example, and he said it's because there's this aggregation function in a transformer, which isn't in a GNN. So I just wondered if, if you could kind of like compare and contrast whether or not neural networks are performing algorithmic generalization and the differences between, let's say, GNNs and transformers. Yeah, so I'm not very familiar with DNNs, so I'll probably avoid commenting on DNNs versus transformers, for so fear of embarrassing myself. Um, in terms of the underlying thing, so I definitely think we have some pretty clear evidence at this point that models are doing some genuine algorithms. Um, 
I don't know. I think my modular edition thing is a pretty clear proof of concept of this. Yeah. So one thing worth stressing is that I generally think of models as having linear representations more than geometric representations. So I think of an input to a model as having many different possible features where features are kind of a property of the input in an intentional sense. Um, but which is kind of a fuzzy and garbage definition. So I prefer the extensional definition of like an example of a feature is like this bit of an image contains a curve or this bit of an image corresponds to a car window or this is the final token in Eiffel Tower or this corresponds to a list variable in Python with at least four elements and all kinds of stuff like that. And, well, I don't know, this, this scene is shaded blue because someone put the wrong filter on the camera. Um, and yeah, I generally think of models as representing features as linear directions in space. And each input is a linear combination of these directions. And this is kind of the classic word to vec framing. Like the um, king minus man equals queen minus woman thing where you can kind of think of this as there being a gender direction and there being a royalty direction. And these are like the right units of analysis rather than king, queen, man, woman being the right units of analysis, but where each of these is made up out of these underlying linear representations. And this is a fairly different perspective to the geometric, where are things in a manifold, how close are they together in Euclidean space, because that's all... That's all kind of a global statement about how close two things are, where you're comparing all possible features, while, I don't know, the Eiffel Tower and the Colosseum are close together in some conceptual space because they are both European landmarks, but they're also very different because France and Italy are fairly different countries in some sense, and maybe they're different on a bunch of other features, or... One of them is two words, the other is one word, which really matters in some ways. And Euclidean distance and geometry is... It, it's a global summary statistic. And all summary statistics lie to you. It's another motto of mine. Um, but in particular, global ones I'm very skeptical of. And yeah, in general, this how... What is the structure of a model of representations? I think is like a really important question. And in particular, models are such high dimensional objects that you really want to be careful to distinguish between the two separate things of, sorry, so again, um, models are such high dimensional objects that it's basically impossible to understand GPT-3 as a 200 billion dimensional vector. You need to be breaking it down into units of analysis that can vary independently and are independently meaningful. And the linear representation hypothesis is like a pretty load-bearing part of how I think about this stuff because it is so... because it allows you to break things down and it seems to be a true fact about how models do things. Though, again, we don't have that much data because we never have enough data. It's really sad. And yeah, um, well, let's exactly. just contrast a little bit. So, so this linear representation hypothesis, this idea that the models break down inputs into many independently varying features and store them as directions in space, much like word to vec and the, um, the GoFi people, I mean, like Foda and Polition, they, they, they brought out this famous critique of connectionism in 1988. And their main argument was systematicity. And they were talking about intention versus extension. And it might just be worth defining what I mean by that. So if I said the teacher of Socrates was Plato, the extension is Plato. The intention is everything. It's the teacher, it's Socrates. You know, if I said four plus five equals nine, nine is the extension, four and plus and five is the intention. So they were saying something very simple. They said in a neural network, the intentional attributes get discarded and that's why the networks don't support what they call compositionality. Now, compositionality 
is actually quite an abstract term because using vector algebra in these analogical reasoning tasks that you were just talking about, so king and queen and so on, that's a form of compositionality. But they would say it's a poor cousin of compositionality because it's only using, um, you know, the, the, domain, the representation is in, a, is in a vector space. And in a vector space, you only have very basic primitive transformations. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't be able to, I mean, for example, you were talking about Paris earlier, you wouldn't do the kind of analogical reasoning they were talking about being able to downstream say were they in paris is paris in europe of course it does happen in in, in this linear representation theory but it happens in a very different way hmm so i guess i'm not sure i fully followed that um i mean this might be a cheap gotcha but a fact about transformers is there's they have this central object called the residual stream mm -hmm. um which i don't know in standard framing can be thought of as the thing that lives in the skip connections but not even is like the key thing about a transformer where each layer reads its input from the residual stream and adds its output back to the residual stream and the residual stream is kind of this shared bandwidth and memory and this means that nothing's ever thrown away unless the model explicitly is trying to do that or is just applying some gradual decay over time. So, you know, if you've got an MLP layer that's saying, I've got four, I've got plus, I've got five, and I want to compute nine, four, five, and plus are still there. I don't know if this actually engaged with your point. And like, I don't know if this matters, but it's true. Yeah, what you're saying is true, but I think the, the point is that those primitives are not actually representable in, in a neural network. So you're saying with this residual stream, <laughs> all of the extensions that came previously also mm -hmm. get passed up so in a later layer you can refer to an extension so the basically the answer of a computation that happened mm -hmm. upstream but what you can't refer to are the intentional attributes of that computation upstream why not like four is an input so you can refer to four because you could think of reading the input as a computation plus is another thing you read five is another thing you read like, what is a thing that is not an output of a computation within this framework? Hmm. I might have to get back to you on that. <laughs> Where's Keith Duggar when you need him? <laughs> what would be a good example of that? Hmm. I mean, I guess it, it's, a, it's about um, symbol manipulation as well. So these, these things could actually be symbolic operations, which can be composed and reused later. And you mm -hmm. would appreciate that a neural network is only ever passing values. So, for example, if it did something which you could represent with a symbolic operation, if you wanted to use that again, I mean, in an MLP, the reason why we use a CNN is because we want to represent the same thing in different places. Mm -hmm. And an MLP would have to learn it. it. It doesn't support translational equivariance. So it would have to learn the same thing a million mm -hmm. times. And it's the same thing with this symbolic compositional generalization that if it actually had this symbolic representation which it used once it could use it everywhere but now it has to relearn it everywhere mm. right like you could if if the model wants to know that paris the capital of france it can spend some parameters on that and for every other capital it needs to separately spend parameters and it can't just have a general map country to capital operation? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, let's, let's use a simple example. So we use an MLP image classifier. Mm -hmm. And I put a tennis ball in, and it's it's mm -hmm. in the bottom left of the visual field. Yep. And, and then I put it in the top right. Mm -hmm. And nothing it's learned from the bottom left will be used. Mm -hmm. So it just it just feels like we're we're wasting the representational capacity just doing the same thing again and again, mm -hmm. and it, and in a transformer, the only reason it does have that um, recognition, you know, that that uh, equivariance in mm -hmm. respect of the position of a pattern, is because of the transformer inductive prior, presumably. Yes, yeah. So it uses the same parameters at each position in the input sequence. So you know, it should be able to do bottom left and top right properly though it does not necessarily have things like rotation built in. Um, I don't know. I feel like machine learning is full of these people who have all kinds of theoretical arguments 
And then they're like, this should be efficient. This should not work. And then GPT-4 laughs at them. And <laughs> I don't know. No theory, no theory is interesting in isolation unless it models reality well. Hmm. And I don't know. I haven't really engaged with this theory in the same way I haven't engaged with most deep learning theory because it just doesn't seem to meet my bar of does this make real predictions about models? Uh, the maximal update parameterization paper from Greg Yang was actually a recent contradiction to this. Right. Of really interesting theory that makes real predictions about models that bear out and get you zero shot hyperparameter transfer. Yeah. But like most things just don't do that. Very interesting. Okay. Okay. Well, I think now is a beautiful opportunity to move over to Othello. Now, there was a recent paper called Do Large Language Models Learn World Models, or Are They Just Surface Statistics by Kenneth Lee? And he said that the recent increase in uh, model and data size has brought about qualitatively new behaviors, such as writing code or solving logic puzzles. Now, he asked the question, yeah, how do these models achieve this kind of performance? Do they merely memorize training data? Or are they picking up the rules of English grammar and uh, grammar and the syntax of the C language, for example? Are they building something akin to an internal world model, an understandable model of the process producing the sequences? And he said that some researchers argue that this is fundamentally impossible for models trained with guess the next word to learn the language meanings of, of language. And, and their performance is, is merely surface statistics, you know, which is to say a long list of correlations that do not reflect a causal model of the process generating the sequence. Now, you said, Neil, that a major source of excitement about the original Othello paper was that it showed that predicting the next word spontaneously learned the underlying structure generating its data. And you said that the obvious inference is that a large language model trained to predict the next token may spontaneously model the world. What do you think? Uh, yes. So I should clarify that that paragraph was me modeling why other people were excited about the paper. Um, oh, okay. But whatever, I can roll with this question. So... And, and maybe bring in your less wrong piece yes. as well. Yeah. Yes. So... The, yeah, I thought Kenneth's paper was super interesting. The exact setup was they train, so Othello is this chess and go-like board game. They took a data set of random legal moves in Othello. They trained a model to predict the next move given a bunch of these transcripts. And then they probed the model and found that it had learned a model of the board state despite only ever being told to predict the next move. And so the way I would define world model is that there's some latent variables that generate the training data. Um, in this case, what the state of the board is. Um, these change over time, like over the sequence, but at least for a transformer, which has a sequence. And the model kind of has an internal representation of this at each point. And they showed that you can probe for this and they showed that you can causally intervene on this and the model will make legal moves in the new board, even if the board state is impossible to reach. Point of order. Can you explain what you mean by probe, just, just so that the uh, listeners at yes. home know it? Yes. So probing is this like old family of interactability techniques. The idea is you think a model has represented something. Like you give it a picture and you tell it to classify the image, and you want to see if it's figured out that the picture is of a red thing versus a blue thing, even though this isn't an explicit part of the output. You take some neuron or layer or just any internal vector of the model, and you train some classifier to map that to, like, red or blue. And you do something like a logistic regression to see if you can extract whether it's red or blue from that. And... Uh, there's also interesting stuff about probing, but I should probably finish explaining the Othello paper first before I get into that tangent. Please. So, yeah, the like reason people are really excited about this paper, uh, it was recently an oral at ICLE, and generally got a lot of hype, was that it was just, you train something to predict the next token, and it forms this rich, emergent model of the world. And forming a model of the world is actually incredibly expensive. They, like, each cell of the 64-cell Othello board has three possible states, three to the 64. It's quite a lot of information to represent. 
but the model did it. And lots of people were like, oh, clearly language models have wobbles. Um, my personal interpretation of all this is that language models predict the next token. They learn effective algorithms for doing this within the constraints of what is natural to represent within transformer layers. And what this means is that if predicting the next token is made easier by having a model of the world, um, of like, I don't know, uh, who the speaker is, this is a thing that will happen. And in some work led by Wes Gurney that we're going to talk about later, we found neurons that detect things like, this text is in French, this text is Python code. And in some sense, this is like a particularly trivial world model. And so, yeah, um, that's an interesting thing. Um, in my opinion, it was kind of a priori obvious that language models would learn this if they could, if they could and needed to, and it was more efficient. Another point to though, mm -hmm. um, learning that something is French seems categorically different to because so when i when i read kenneth's original mm -hmm. piece he showed what looked like a topological representation of the world mm -hmm. so how different state spaces were related to each other in a kind mm -hmm. of network structure hmm so i wonder if you can remember how we produced that diagram of yeah, so I'm struggling to remember the details. I think it was something of the form, look at how different cells are represented in the model and look at how close together the representations of different cells are. And, oh, the model has kind of got internal representations that are close together. I don't think this is fundamentally different from the king, queen, man, woman thing. It was just it's like learn some structure on those representations that's obviously kind of reasonable. Yeah. I, yeah, I wouldn't read too much into that. Like, models learn structural representations, I think, is old news at this point. Um, but... Well, so maybe another the, interesting angle is that one of the reasons why people like Gary Marcus, they say GPT is parasitic on the data. They say because they are empirical models, most of the meaning, most of the information is not in the data. <laughs> we have to reason over explicit world models. So he thinks... The reason a GPS is so good is because we've imputed this abstract world model. And similarly, when we play chess, we have an abstract world model. And he would argue that the information about that abstract world model doesn't exist in any data. Mm -hmm. So how do you go from the data to the model? And the Othello game seemed to show that you could go mm -hmm. from the data to the model. Yeah. So I know. I think that viewpoint is just like obviously wrong. Like... You're trying, you're trying to do a data prediction problem. A valid solution to that is to model the underlying world and use this predict what comes next. There's clearly enough information in an information theoretic sense to do this. And the question is, is a model capable of doing that or not? And I don't know. I'm just like, you can't write poetry with statistical correlations. You need to be learning something. Maybe that's not a good example. I don't believe you can write like... Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. believe you can produce like good answers to like difficult code forces problems. It's like do good software engineering as purely a bundle of statistical correlations. Um, maybe I have too much respect for software engineers. I don't know. So where does it come from then? Um, that flash of inspiration or that higher mm -hmm. level... I guess the first question is, do you, is there a jump? Is it actually grounded in the data it's trained on? Or is there some high level reasoning? You know, where, where does that materialize mm -hmm. from? So the way I think about it, there is just a space of possible algorithms that can be implemented in a transformer's weights. And some of these look like a world model. And some of these look like a bunch of statistical correlations. And models are trading off lots of different resources, like how many dimensions does this consume? How much weight norm? How many parameters? Um, how hard is this to get to and how weird and intricate? And models will choose the thing that gets the best loss that is most efficient on these dimensions. 
assuming they can reach it within the lost landscape. Well, I use choose in a very anthropomorphic sense, like Adam chooses good solutions. And I don't know, if you have a sufficiently hard task and forming a world model is like the right solution to it, models can do it. And I think people will try to put all of these fancy philosophizing on it in a way that I just think is false. Guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the Othello paper is like a really beautiful, elegant setup that proves this. Hmm. All right, can I move on to the plot twist? Does it prove it though? Um, it's very, it's, it's a, it's a very small, contrived. It's, it's a big jump to assume that that works on a large language model. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of the argument I'm making. I think there's the empirical question of do language models do this, and the theoretical question of could they do this. And I'm saying I think the theoretical question is nonsense. Mm -hmm. And I think the Othello paper very conclusively proves the theoretical question is nonsense. They're just like, yeah, when given a bunch of data, you can infer the underlying world model behind it. Well, I, in I theory. I would push back on that a, a tiny bit mm -hmm. because it's very similar to AlphaGo mm -hmm. proved that in a closed game, which is systematic and representable, um, you know, with a, with a finite, obviously exponentially large, but mm -hmm. a finite number of board states, you can you you can build an agent which mm -hmm. performs really really well. That seems to me completely different to something like language or acting in the real world that might not be systematic in the same way. Mm -hmm. We can debate whether or not it's. I think it's an infinite number of possible trajectories, mm -hmm. just like language, an infinite number of possible sentences. No man, there's fifty thousand to the power of a thousand possible infant sequences. Sure is a finite number. <laughs> You mean in, in Othello or? Uh, no, no, in GPT-2. In GPT-2, okay. Uh, bounded context length, bounded vocab size, oh, generally. Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to write more than one quintillion characters, probably. Yeah. All right, being a yeah. parent, do continue. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I guess it is still a big jump, though, isn't it? From, yes, empirically it shows that in Othello... It works. Maybe maybe we could debate whether or not it, it does or, or not. Because there's always this question coming back to what we were saying before, whether it's learning something which is universal mm -hmm. or, or something which is still brittle. Mm -hmm. So the way that we've evaluated it might lead us to conclude that it's universal, whereas actually it's brittle in ways that we don't understand. So that's mm -hmm. a very real possibility. Yeah. I mean, like everything's brittle in ways you don't understand. Uh, it's like pretty rare that a model will do everything perfectly in a way that there are no adversarial examples. And this is like one of the more interesting things that's come out of the adversarial examples literature to me. It's just like, oh, wow, there's so much stuff here. There's so there's such a high dimensional input space. There's all kinds of weird things the model wasn't prepared for. And I don't know, my interpretation of the Othello thing is the strong theoretical arguments are wrong. I separately believe that you know, um, there are world models that could be implemented in a language model's weights. But I also disagree with the strong inference of the paper that this does happen in language models, or that we conclude it does, because world models are often really expensive. Like, in the Othello model, it's consuming 128 dimensions of its 512 dimensional residual stream for this world model. And the problem is set up so the world model is insanely useful. Because whether a move is legal is purely determined by the board state, so it's worth the model's while to do this. But this is rarely the case in language. For example, there was all this buzz about Bing chat playing chess and making legalish moves. Yes. And I don't know, man, if you want to model a chessboard, you just look at the last piece that moved into a cell. That's the piece in that cell. You don't need an explicit representation, you can just use attention heads to do it. And there's all kinds of weird hacks, and like models will generally use the best hack. But probably it is worth the model's while to have some kind of an internal representation. Like I'd bet that if you took a powerful code playing model and probed it to understand the state of the key variables, it would probably have some representation. But I guess moving on to the work I did building on the Othello paper. Hmm. So one of the things that was really striking to me about the Othello work is simultaneously its results were strong enough that something here was clearly real. 
Um, but they also used techniques that felt more powerful than were needed. Like, rather, th they found that linear probes did not work. There weren't just directions in space corresponding to board states, but the nonlinear probes, one hidden layer MLPs, did. And the key thing to be careful of when probing is, is your probe doing the computation, or does the model genuinely have this represented? And even with linear probes, it can be, this can be misleading. Like, if you're looking at how a model represents colored shapes, and you find a red triangle direction, it could be that there's a red, green, or blue direction, and a triangle, square, or shape direction, and you're taking the red plus triangle, or it could be the case that each of the nine shapes has its own direction, you found the red triangle one. But nonlinear probing is particularly sketchy. Like, in the extreme case, if you train GPT-3 on the inputs to something, GPT-3 can do a lot of stuff. Um, if you train GPT-3 on the activation side network, it can probably recover arbitrary functions of the input, assuming the information on the input hasn't been lost, which it shouldn't have because there's a residual stream. Um, and uh, what I said is not quite true, but not important. Um, and so I was, and their intervention technique was, both got like very impressive results, but also involved doing a bunch of complex gradient descent against that probe. And this all just seemed more powerful than was necessary. And so I did the, I challenged myself to do a weekend hackathon, trying to figure out what was going on. And I poked around at some internal circuitry and tried to answer some very narrow questions about the model. And I found this one neuron that seemed to be looking for like three cell diagonal lines where one was blank, the other was white, the next was black. But then sometimes it activated on blank, black, white. And it turns out that the general pattern was that it was blank, current players, sorry, blank, opponent's color, and current player's color. And uh, this is a useful motif in Othello because it makes the move legal. And when I saw this, I made the bold hypothesis. Maybe the model actually represents things in terms of whether a cell has the current player's color or the current opponent's color. Which in hindsight is a lot more natural because the model plays both black and white. And it's kind of symmetric from the perspective of the current player. And I trained a linear probe on this. And it just worked fabulously and got near perfect accuracy. And I tried linear representations on it. Uh, I tried linear interventions and it just worked. And I feel really excited about this project for a bunch of reasons. First, lol, I did it on a weekend. I'm still very proud of this. Um, secondly, I think that it has vindicated some of my general suspicion of nonlinear probing. Like if you really understand a thing, you should be able to get a linear probe to work. And kind of more deeply, as we discussed, there's this words to vex style linear representation hypothesis about models that features correspond to directions. The Othello work seemed like pretty strong evidence against. They had causal interventions showing that the board state was there, but actually um, nonlinear, but linear probes did not work. Seemed like they found some nonlinear representation. And my and Chris Ola's hypothesis seeing this was that um, there was a linear representation hiding beneath. Um, Martin Wattenberg, one of the authors of the paper, had the hypothesis that it was like an actual nonlinear representation, and this was evidence against the hypothesis. And this kind of formed a natural experiment where the hypothesis could have been falsified, but my work showed there was a real nonlinear, a real linear representation, and thus that it had predictive power. And so many of our frameworks for MacInterp are just these loose things based on a bunch of data, but not fully rigorous or fully conclusively shown. And so natural experiments like this feel like some of the best data we have. On, on this linear representation, mm -hmm. though, I don't know if you've heard of the spline theory of neural networks by Randall Balestriero. Mm -hmm. And um, without going into too much detail, it, it's quite a discrete view of MLPs in particular that the, the ReLUs essentially get activated in an input sensitive way to carve out these polyhedra in the ambient space. Mm -hmm. And essentially um, an input will be mapped into one of these cells in the ambient space. And then there's a kind of um, discreteness to it because if you 
just perturb the input and you move outside of one of these polyhedra, then the model will, if it's a class of classifier, classify something different. But I guess I want to understand with this representation theory, if features are directions, does that imply there's a kind of continuity that because the network will learn to um, spread out those representations in the best possible way, but it won't necessarily be a way which is semantically useful, like in word to vec stop and go are very close to each other and they mm -hmm. shouldn't be. And at what point does stop become go? So do you, do you see there being boundaries in, in these mm -hmm. directions? So I think this is again, my point that I think of linear representations as being importantly different from geometric representations, mm. like stop should be close to go because in many contexts they are like a kind of changing of the state term and it's used in similar contexts and has similar grammatical meaning but then on this like single semantic thing they're like quite different and the natural way to represent this is have them be close together in euclidean space but have some crucial like negation dimension where they're different and the context and like Ultimately, neural networks are not geometric objects. They are made of linear algebra. Every neuron's input is just project the residual stream onto some vector. And this involves just selecting some set of directions and taking a linear combination of the feature corresponding to each of those. And this is just the natural way for a model to represent things, in my opinion. Okay. Okay. Well, I think this will, in a second, lead us on very nicely to superposition, which is that we don't actually think of um, there being one um, direction necessarily. Just just to close this little piece. Now, you, you said in your Less Wrong article that Othello GPT is likely over-parameterized for good performance on this particular task, while language models are under-parameterized. And of course, we have the ground truth to this task, which makes it very, very easy. So much easier to interpret. 100%. But, but you, did, you did conclude saying that this is further evidence that neural networks are genuinely understandable and interpretable, and probing on the face of it seems like a very exciting approach to understand what the models really represent, caveat M mTOR conceptual issues. So let's move on to, to this superposition, also known as polysemanticity, which is an absolutely beautiful... Well, you're shaking your head a little bit, so maybe, <laughs> maybe you start with that. Um, yeah, so there's... All right, so what, what's the narrative here? So fundamentally, we are trying to engage with models as these high-dimensional objects in kind of this conceptual way. So we need to be able to decompose them because of the curse of dimensionality. And uh, we think models correspond to features and the features correspond to directions. And the hope in the early field was that features would correspond to neurons. And even if you believe features correspond to orthogonal directions, the same thing they correspond to neurons is like a pretty strong one, because a priori there's no reason to align with the neuron basis. The reason this isn't a crazy belief is that models are incentivized to represent features in ways that can vary independently from each other. And because ReLUs and JELUs act element-wise, um, if there's a feature per neuron, they can vary independently. Well, if there's multiple features in the same neuron, I don't know, if there's a ReLU, the second feature could change so the ReLU goes from on to off in a way that changes how the other feature is expressed in the downstream network. And this is like a beautiful theoretical argument. Sadly, it's bullshit because of this phenomena of polysemanticity. Uh, polysemanticity is a behavioral observation of networks. But when we look at neurons and look at things that activate them, they're often activated by seemingly unrelated things, like the ers in the word strangers, and capital letters of proper nouns in news articles about football. Uh, it's a particularly fun neural I found one time in a language model. And um, polysemanticity is a purely behavioral thing. We're just saying, this neuron activates for a bunch of seemingly unrelated stuff. Um, and it's possible that actually we're missing some galaxy brain abstraction where all of this is related. But my guess is that this is just, the model is not aligning features with neurons. And one explanation of this is you've just got this thing called a distributed representation. 
where a feature is made of a linear combination of different neurons. But it is kind of rotated from the neural basis. And this argument that neurons can vary independently is a reason to think you wouldn't see this. Um, where uh, this hypothesis is just that there's still n things when there's n neurons, but they're rotated. Um, but then there's this stronger hypothesis that tries to explain this called the superposition hypothesis. And here the idea is, so if a model wants to be able to recover a feature perfectly, it must be orthogonal from all other features. But if it wants to mostly recover it, it suffices to have almost orthogonal vectors. And you can fit in many, many more almost orthogonal vectors into a space than orthogonal vectors. As theorem saying that there are exponentially many in the number of dimensions. How, if, if you have 100 dimensional vectors, um, how many orthogonal directions are there? What's 100. the relationship? 100. Yep. Um, yep. This is just the statement that, like, you pick one, you, you pick a vector. Um, oh, sorry, there's 100 vectors that are all orthogonal of each other. Um, basic proof you pick a vector, mm -hmm. everything's orthogonal to that, that's a 99 dimensional space. Mm -hmm. You pick another vector, take everything orthogonal to that, that's a 98 dimensional space and keep going until you get to nothing. Um, like if you picture a 2D space, you pick any direction, the only things orthogonal to that are a line, and so there's exactly two orthogonal things you can fit in. And there's like, you can rotate this and you can get many different sets of orthogonal things. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to articulate why this doesn't make sense to me. So maybe we should start with the curse of dimensionality, mm -hmm. which is that the volume of the space increases exponentially with the number of dimensions. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll start with that. And the reason I'm, I'm thinking, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but if you've got a hundred dimensional vector, um, every combination of flipping one of the dimensions would be would produce a vector which is orthogonal mm -hmm. to all of the other ones, would it not? Uh, no. So... Uh, let's imagine you've got a vector of all ones. Yes. If you pick the first element and you negate it, yeah. So it's like minus one, then ninety nine ones. These are not orthogonal. The dot product is ninety eight. Okay. Okay. Well, that that makes sense. So so there's there's a linear number of um, orthogonal directions, yep. and in which case we actually need to have these approximately orthogonal directions because that actually does buy us mm -hmm. an exponential number. Yeah, and so the superposition hypothesis is that the model represents more features than it has neurons, yes, or that it has dimensions, and it somehow compresses them in as things that are almost orthogonal. Mm -hmm. When it reads them out with a projection, it gets some interference, but the inter and it needs to balance the value of representing more features against the costs of interference. And Anthropic has this fantastic paper called Toy Models of Superposition. Uh, which sadly was written after I left, so I can't claim any credit. And um, what they they basically build a toy model that exhibits superposition. The uh, exact structure is you have n independent features, each of which is zero most of the time. It's not very prevalent. And there's a linear map from that to a small dimensional space, a linear map back up, and a nonlinearity on the output. Uh, no nonlinearity on the input on the bottleneck in the middle, and you s you train it to be an autoencoder. Can it recover the features in the input? And because there's many more features than there are in the bottleneck, this tests whether the model can actually do this. And they find that it sometimes does, sometimes doesn't, and then do a lot of really in-depth investigation of how this varies. And yeah, returning to like, is superposition the same thing as polysemanticity? Um, I would say no. Polysemanticity is a behavioral thing. Distributed representations are also a behavioral thing, that it's like not aligned with the basis. And superposition is a mechanistic hypothesis for why both of these will happen. Because if you have more features than neurons, obviously you're going to have multiple features per neuron, and probably you're going to have features that are not aligned with neurons. Okay, okay, very interesting. So why do you think that superposition is one of the biggest problems in McIntyre? Yeah, so it's this fundamental thing that we need to be able to decompose a model into individual units. And ideally, these would be neurons, but they are not neurons. 
So we need to figure out what we're doing. And superposition, so in a world where we we just had like n meaningful directions, but they weren't aligned with the standard basis, that'd be kind of doable. Um, and indeed, models often have a like linear bottlenecks, like the residual stream or the keys, queries, and values of an attention head that don't have element-wise linearities and so have no intrinsically meaningful basis. Uh, the jargon here is privileged basis. Hmm. And, but um, superposition means that you can't even say this feature should be orthogonal to everything else. There's going to be a bunch of interference. Um, there's not even a kind of <clears throat> mathematically, mathematically, there's not even like a, unique set of more than n directions to describe some set of vectors in n-dimensional space. Um, and I think that understanding how to extract features from superposition, given that superposition seems like a core part of how models do things, though we really do not have as much data here as I would like us to, <laughs> um, understanding how to extract the right meaningful units seems really important. Okay, and I, th I think we should clarify the difference between computational and representational superposition. Yeah, so there's kind of... So transformers are interesting because they often have high-dimensional activations that get linearly mapped to low-dimensional things. So like in, say, GPT-2, in, say, GPT-2-small, the residual stream has 768 dimensions while each MLP layer has 3,000 neurons. And even if we think each neuron just produces a single feature, they need to get compressed down to the 768-dimensional residual stream. And we, or there's like 50,000 input tokens that get compressed to 768 dimensions. And this is called representational superposition. The model is representing... The model's already computed the features, but it's compressing them to some bottleneck space. And this is the main thing studied in the toy models of superposition paper. And what we found, uh, sorry, um, there's a separate thing of computational superposition, which is when the model is doing, it's computing new features. This needs nonlinearities like attention head softmaxes or MLP jellies. And the nonlinearities can compute new features as directions from the old ones. Like, um, if this, uh, for example, uh, if the top of an image is a car window and the bottom is a car wheel, then it's a car. Um, or... If the current token is Johnson and the previous token was Boris, this is Boris Johnson. And this is all... How to phrase this? Um, yeah, this is computational superposition. If the model wants to compute more features than it has neurons. And this is like much harder to reason about because linear algebra is nice and fairly well understood. Non-linearities, spoilers in the name, are not linear, and thus way more of a pain. And I think that we generally have a much less good handle on computational superposition, but also that this is like way more of where the interestingness lies by my lights. And this is very briefly studied in the toy models of superposition paper, but I would love to see more work looking at this in practice and also looking at this in toy models. So zooming out a, a tiny bit, there's this paper from Anthropic, mm -hmm. and the overall question to me is, does it actually exist? Now, presumably, you're satisfied with the evidence that it does exist. And then there's the question of, how do neural networks actually do it? And then there's the question of, how does the neural network think, anthropomorphic language, I apologize, about the trade-off of more, superpos more superposition, more features, but more interference, versus less interference and more superposition. Mm, yeah, so diving into the final question about interference, um, the a useful conceptual distinction is that there's two different kinds of interference. Um, so if you've got two features that share a dimension or share a neuron, 
Um, oh yeah, final note on representational superposition is I don't think it should even be referred to in terms of neurons because the individual base elements don't have intrinsic meaning. Modulo weird quirks like Adam. Um, and it annoys me when people refer to the residual stream or key vectors as having neurons. Yep. There's no element-wise linearity. It's not privileged. Anyway, um, yeah, two types of interference. Um, when A and B share a dimension, you can... Um, yeah, let's say this dimension has both dice and poetry. You first off need to tell where if dice is there but poetry is not... You need to tell that dice is there and that poetry is not there. And if both, which I call alternating interference, and then there's simultaneous interference where dice and poetry are both there, I need to tell that both are there, but not that they're both there with like double strength. And as a general rule, models are good at dealing with things of the form. Notice when something is extreme along this dimension, but not... Um, notice when it is extreme along a dimension um, versus when it's not extreme. And alternating so alternating interference looks like that. Like if um, dice is straight up, poetry is at 45 degrees, both have like weak inter both have less interference when the other one is active than when the main one is active along their direction. Okay, so you're saying interference from A and not B is far mm -hmm. easier than A and B. Yes, exactly. Right. And um, like a very a very rough heuristic is models will just not do simultaneous interference, but will do alternating interference. And they observed this in the toy models paper um, because they varied how often a feature was non-zero, uh, what I think of as the prevalence of the feature, though they called it sparsity. And what they found is that when the feature was less prevalent, it was much more likely to be in superposition. And the way to think about this is if you have two independent features that both exist with probability p, the rate of simultaneous interference is p squared, the rate of alternating is p. And so, and the worth of having the feature is also proportional to p, because it occurs p of the time. So the rarer it is, the less of a big deal simultaneous interference is. And eventually the model uses superposition. There's also, there was also an interesting bit looking at correlated features. Mm -hmm. um, so correlated features, even if they're not very prevalent, they have pretty high simultaneous interference. And models tend to put correlated features in to be orthogonal. But anti-correlated features, it's very happy for them to share a direction. One way you could think about this is if you've got, say, 25 features about romance novels and 25 features about Python code, you could have 25 directions that each contain a pair of features and then a single disambiguating neuron that is on for Python code, off for romance novels that you use to disambiguate the two. And yeah, maybe this would be a good time to talk about the finding neurons in a haystack paper. Or unless well, you've got more stuff on this. We'll get to that in All just right. two shakes of a lamb's tail. But just before, um, when, when I was reading through the paper, I, I, uh, was, I had the mindset of sparsity. And you told me, Tim, don't, don't say sparsity. It's prevalence. It means and so many things. It means so many. It's very overloaded. It's such an overloaded word. So, you know, so just quickly touch on the relationship between mm -hmm. or what, what is prevalence, the relationship between prevalence and superposition. And um, just before... Well, actually, I've got a couple more questions, but um, would you also just mind playing devil's advocate and criticizing the anthropic paper if, if you can? Mm -hmm. uh, sure. So I should be very clear. This is one of my top three all-time favorite interpretability papers. It's a fantastic paper. Uh, that <laughs> won't said, do a, a bad word said about it. Um, oh, I have so much. I, I have bad words to say about every paper. Oh, good. Especially the ones that I like because I've engaged with them in the most detail. Yes. So... Uh, Things which I think were misleading about this paper. Uh, the first is I think the representational versus computational superposition distinction is very important. I think computational is a fair bit more interesting. And while I think the authors knew the difference, I think a casual reader often came away not realizing the difference. In particular, that most of their results were about the residual stream, not about actual neurons and MLP layers. Um, 
The second is a question of activation range. So they study features that vary uniformly between 0 and 1. And in practice, I think most features are binary. This is a car wheel, or this is not a car wheel. This is this is Boris Johnson, or this is not Boris Johnson. And it interference is much worse when they can vary continuously. Because if A and B, if A is up, B is at 45 degrees, you, you can't distinguish B at strength 1 from A at strength um, 0.7-ish. And this is just kind of messy. But that binary is just much easier. And I think this is a source of confusion. Um, yeah. I also think the two kinds of interference point was a bit understated. And yeah. But like more broadly, it's just a phenomenal paper. Oh, uh, my other biggest beef is they just didn't look in real models. And like, this wasn't the point of the paper, but like, yeah. oh, we're doing so much theory crafting and forming conceptual frameworks. And we haven't really checked very hard whether this is why models actually have police mantisti. Um, Wes Gurney, he's working out of MIT and um, you've, you've done a lot of work with him. So uh, you and Wes, um, but Wes was the first author, wrote a paper called Finding Neurons in a Haystack, Case Studies with Sparse Probing, where you empirically studied superposition in language models and, and actually found that you get lots of superpositions in early layers for features like the security and social security and fewer in middle layers for complex features like this text is French. So, um, and also you can bring in the importance of range activations as well, but can, can you frame up that paper? Yeah. Uh, so first off, this paper was led by Wes Gunny, one of my mentees, did a fantastic job. He deserves like 9% of the credit. Great job, Wes. Uh, I think he listens to this podcast, so hi. Um, and yeah, so... The kind of high-level pitch behind the paper was, well, we think superposition is happening, but, like, nobody's really checked very hard. And there's, like, some results in the literature I've since come across in non-transformer models that demonstrate some amount of distributed representations, but what would it look like to check? And what would it look like to do this in, like, a reasonably scalable and quantitative way? And um, the kind of sparse probing in the title is this technique Wes introduces for um, if we think a feature is represented in MLP layer, we can train a linear classifier to extract it, a linear probe from that layer, but if we constrain the probe to use at most k neurons, very k, and look at probe performance, this lets us distinguish between features that are represented with like a single neuron and features that are densely spread across all neurons, um, with a lot of methodological nuances about balanced data sets and avoiding overfitting and fun stuff like that. And most of the interesting bits of the paper, in my opinion, are the various case studies we do, where... So probing fundamentally is like a kind of sketchy methodology, because probing is correlational. Probing doesn't tell you whether a model uses something, and it's so easy to trick yourself about whether you have the right representations. Um, so we use it as a starting point and then dig more deeply into a few more interesting things. Um, one particularly cute case study is we looked into factual knowledge neurons, found something that seemed to represent this athlete plays hockey, but then it actually turned out to be a Canada neuron, uh, which continues to bring me joy. That activates with things like maple syrup and Wonderful. Canada. Wonderful. Um, gotta, gotta love models learning national stereotypes, right? Oh, yes. Um, anyway. So, um, yeah, so there were two particularly exciting case studies. The first was looking in early layers at compound word detectors. So, if you look at, say, the brain and its visual field, we have all these sensory neurons. We get raw input of light from the environment, and it gets converted into stuff our brain can actually manipulate. Image models have Gabor filters that convert the pixels into something a bit more useful. Uh, what's the equivalent of language models? And it seems to be these things that we call detokenization neurons and circuitry, where often words are split into multiple tokens, or you get common word, compound word phrases, like social security, or Theresa May, or Barack Obama, whatever. 
And it's often useful for a model to realize this is the second thing in a multi-token phrase, especially if it's like you need both things to know what's going on. Like Michael Jordan. Lots of Michaels, lots of Jordans. It's really important to tell that both, both of them are there. And this is a clearly nonlinear thing because it's like a Boolean and. And so we did a lot of probing for different compound words. And we found that they were definitely not represented well by single neurons. We could find some neurons that were okay at detecting them, but there was a lot of interference and a lot of like false positives from other stuff. And when we dug into a bunch of these neurons, we found that they were incredibly polysemantic. They activated for many different compound words. And we showed that it was using superposition by observing that if you took, say, five social security detecting neurons and add together their activations, they go from okay detectors to a really good detector together. Because even though each is representing like hundreds of compound words, um, they're representing different compound words, which lets you encode these. And um, this, what we've shown here is that it's like distributed, that it's a linear combination of neurons. Um, we still haven't shown it perfectly to my satisfaction. I think you really need to do things like ablate these linear combinations and see if this systematically damages the model's ability to think about social security, etc. But I'm pretty convinced at this point. And there's like a few properties of compound words that both make it easy to represent in superposition, make me pretty okay making the jump that there's actual superposition. The first is just that there's tons of compound words. Each one is pretty rare, but each one is like non-trivially useful. And clearly there are more compound words than there are the like thousand neurons in the MLP layer of this model. The, the model cares about representing and can represent that we did not actually check. Uh, because I could not convince Wes to accumulate a list of 2,000 compound words and probe for all of them. Um, but I believe in my heart this is true. Could, could I have mm -hmm. a point of order, though? So, um, Go for it. Because I've been reading quite a lot of stuff from um, linguists like Stephen Piantadosi, and um, I mean, a lot of linguists are, some of them hate language models, and some of them are well on board with it. And, you know, like Raphael Millier, for example, is, 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 is a great example. Um, I hate language models too, don't worry. Well, but but the question is because you're talking about compound words and stuff like that, and and you're you're still using the language of syntax, and these language models, there's this distribution hypothesis. They, you know, you know a, you know the meaning of a word by the company it keeps. But linguists and cognitive scientists kind of ditch that. Well, I don't think I don't think they ever believed in the distributional hypothesis. They think about grounding. They think about grounding two things in the world. Um, and and also inferential um, uh, references as well, which is you can think of that as grounding to a model of the mind. And this brings us back to the Othello paper, which is that they're not just learning simple kind of compound relationships between the world uh, mm -hmm. between the words. They're learning a world model, and mm -hmm. and they're doing something much more potentially than just predicting the mm -hmm. next word. And Piantadosi argued that most of the representational capacity in, in um, language models are learning these semantics. They're learning relationships between things in the world model and the particular occurrence of, of, of the token. And this superposition idea is very interesting because it actually imbues the representational capacity in a language model to learn those mappings. Mm. Uh, okay, so a couple of comments on that. Uh, the first is a generally useful way of thinking about models to me is as a the early layers devoted to sensory neurons converting the raw input into more useful concepts and representations the actual processing throughout like all of the middle layers that actually does all the reasoning and then motor neurons at the end that convert the reasoning to actual output tokens for like the format that the optimizer wants and it feels like you're mostly talking about the like reasoning internally and i am the specific case study i'm referring to is on the sensory neurons well like i'm not saying it just detects compound words but obviously that's the first thing it does i don't know it's so interesting i don't mean to push back but in neuroscience the field was held back for decades by this idea of this kind of 
left to right processing, this hierarchical mm -hmm. processing where you have these um, very, very simple concepts that become increasingly abstract with more processing. Mm -hmm. And then I think the field has moved away from that. It's far mm -hmm. more messy and chaotic than that. Now, with a neural network, it, it actually is hierarchical because the network is basically yep. a, a, a DAG. So I suppose it is safe to make this assumption. But could I just kind of question you on that? Is it safe to make that assumption? Is there increasing complexity in representation as you go from left to right? Uh, let's see. Uh, so, yeah. I definitely... Yeah. So, clarification one. The network has this input sequence, which I think was going from left to right. Mm -hmm. And then there's a bunch of layers, which I think it was going from, like, the bottom to the top. Yes. And you're referring to the bottom to top axis, right? I, yeah, I'm sorry. I was using an MLP um, mindset when I asked that question. So as you say, in, in a transformer, it's an autoregressive model and you have, you know, stacked attention yes. layers with little MLPs on the end. So I guess the way I was actually meaning the question is, yeah. so so, mm -hmm. so complexity increases mm -hmm. monotonically as you go up the stack of yep. attention layers. Is, is, that, is that a fair assumption? Um, yep. Uh, again, no one's really shown this properly, but I'm like, surely this is true. And there's been some work doing things like looking at neurons, looking at the text that activates them, looking for patterns and trying to understand what, what these represent. And it's generally looked like early ones are more about detokenization and syntax. Later ones are doing stuff that's interesting. Final ones are doing this like motor neuron behavior. But like I also want to be very clear that networks are cursed. <laughs> networks do not fit into nice abstractions. I'm not saying... The early layers are literally only doing detokenization. Yeah. But I believe we have shown it's part of what they're doing. And I speculate it is a large part of what they're doing. I'd be very surprised if it's all of what they're doing. Because I heard you on another podcast and it, it, you were just talking about the, I mean, the, I think the curse is the right way to describe it, which is that even when you make um, modifications, when you manipulate what's happening, the behavior will change in a very reflexive way. Mm. So you kind of, you delete one thing and then another neuron will take on the responsibility of the thing it's you so just annoying. deleted. And so, so you're, you're, it's a little bit like manipulating financial markets. You've got almost like this weird collective mm. diffuse intelligence where you make one modification and the whole thing changes in a very complex way. And similarly, I guess that's why I was intuitively questioning the assumption that you have a residual stream. So surely, even at the very top of that attention stack, there must be primitive and complex operations going on in some weird mix. Um, seems probably true. Uh, generally, yeah, there's going to be some stuff you can just do with literally the embeddings. Um, some stuff that you need to wait a bit more before you can do anything useful with. Just like, I don't know, if you got a sentence about Michael Jordan, I don't think you can usefully use Michael or Jordan in isolation. So you yes. need to detokenize to Michael Jordan. But also, I don't know, if you've got Barack Obama, Obama and Barack, both on their own, pretty clearly imply it's going to be about Obama. And probably the model can start doing some processing in the early, in like layer zero. Does it want to? Somewhat unclear. It's going to depend a lot on the model's constraints and other circuitry and how much it's worth spending the parameters then versus later. There's also some various things where, I don't know, um, model memory kind of decays over time because the residual stream's norm gets bigger. So early layer outputs become a smaller fraction of the overall thing. And layer norm sets the norm to be units, so things kind of decay. And so if you compute a feature in the early, in like layer zero, it can be harder to notice by like layer three than if it was computed in layer two. But these are all just kind of like mild nudges and ultimately neural networks do what neural networks want man i know i know i just want to close the loop on something i said a little while ago about you know potentially large models use most of their representational capacity for um you know learning these semantic relationships and empirically we found that you know there's some question recently actually about do we actually need to have really mm -hmm. really large models and for pure knowledge representation, the argument seems to be yes, but we can disentangle knowing from reasoning. And and there's also this mimicry thing. So it's quite interesting that all of the, you know, like Facebook released their model and very, very quickly people fine-tuned it using the, the LoRa, mm -hmm. you know, the, the low rank approximation fine-tuning method. 
And uh, on all of the benchmarks, the mod, I mean, even Open Assistant is another great example. Yannick was sitting in your seat just a few weeks ago, and he was saying that on, on many of the benchmarks, the model's working really well, but it's kind of not. It's kind of mimicry, like the, the big, large models that, you know, Meta and Google and DeepMind and all these people, they spend millions training these models, and, and they, have, they have base knowledge about the world, which... Um, is not going to be, you know, replicated by fine tuning, you know, like an open source model anytime soon. The knowledge is based. The knowledge is based. Yes, 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 exactly. Well, um, okay, so so that's 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 very interesting. Let's just quickly talk about the OpenAI microscope because this, this isn't the OpenAI microscope is this beautiful app that OpenAI released in in 2020, and you can go on there and you can. You can click on um, any of the neurons in popular vision architectures at the time. So you know, I think most of them are sort of like ImageNet, you know, things like AlexNet and God knows what else. And um, they they solve this optimization problem where they generate an image using um, stochastic gradient descent that maximally activates a particular neuron or I think even a layer using something similar to Deep Dream. And you can click on these neurons and sometimes they are what we will call poly sort of monosemantic, which mm -hmm. means it's just Canada. A lot of the time, there's a couple of concepts in there that it's weirdly intelligible. You know, you might see, uh, you know, like um, a playing card or an ace and, and a couple of like tangentially related concepts. And it always struck me as strange because I imagine there's a long tail of semantic relationships. And I found it bizarre that there'd only be one or two in this visualization. And I had this intuition that the optimization algorithm is in some sense mode seeking mm -hmm. rather than distribution matching, mm -hmm. which is to say that it finds the two most or two or three or four most kind of salient semantic mappings and they dominate what is visualized. And you're almost snipping off the long tail of, of the other semantic mappings. Yeah. So I think there's two things to disentangle here. The first is what is actually represented by the neuron in terms of ground truth. And the second is what our techniques show us. So um, the two techniques used in the open AI microscope are looking at the images, the most activated neuron, and then this feature visualization technique where they produce a synthetic image that maximally activates it. And to me, this is these are like, both of these can be misleading because if the model activates for dice and poetry, but activates for dice with strength five and poetry with strength four, then the optimal image activator will be dice and the optimal, the data set examples will also be dice, but really it'll be about poetry. And you want to get a lot more rigorous. You want to show true monosemanticity. Um, one cute thing is spectrum plots. You take lots of example data set examples across the full distribution. You have a histogram with like the different groups for the different meanings and then neural activation on the x-axis. We have this really cute plot in Wes's paper called the French neuron, where all of the French where all of the French text is on the right, all the non-French text is on the left, and the neuron is just very clearly distinguishing the two in a way that's much more convincing to me than things like max act examples. Um, and I actually have a hobby project called Neuroscope at neuroscope.io, where you can see the max activating text examples for every neuron and a bunch of language models. Though opening, I recently output this paper with one that is just better, but only for GPT-2XL. Um, anyway, uh, not that I'm bitter or anything. Not at all. Not at all. Um, and yeah, so yeah, there's the things can lie to you and be illusory. Um, there's this interesting paper called The Interruptibility Illusion for Burt, which mm. investigated this specific phenomena. And in particular, that if you take the, the data set examples over some narrow distribution, like Wikipedia or books, you can get pretty misleading things. Though they only looked at residual stream basis elements rather than actual MLP neurons. I believe, which makes it a bit less compelling. Um, Point of order as well. We've been mm -hmm. saying residual stream quite a lot. And Microsoft introduced ResNet in 2015, which basically means that between all of the layers, 
the information is being passed up unadulterated. Mm -hmm. So the subsequent layer can choose to either essentially shortcut or ignore the previous layer or use some combination. And at the time, they kind of said it was about the neural network being able to learn its own capacity in in some sense but could could you just give us like the way you think about these residual mm -hmm. streams yeah so i think the standard view of neural networks is there are just layers and layer five's output is layer six's input etc um then people added resnets where layer six's input is layer five's output plus layer five's input with the skip connection but I think people normally thought of them as like, oh, it's like a cute trick that makes the model better, but doesn't massively change my conceptual picture. And the framing that I believe was introduced in the mathematical framework, this anthropic paper led by Chris Ola, Nelson Elhaj, and Catherine Olson that I was involved with, is actually, let's call the thing in the skip connection the residual stream and think of it as the central object and draw our model so the residual stream is this big vertical thing and each layer is like a small diversion to the side rather than the other way around. And in practice, most circuits involve things skipping many layers. And each layer should is better thought of as like an incremental update. And there's a bunch of earlier transformer interpretability papers that I think miss this conceptual point, like the interpretable illusion for BERT one I mentioned earlier, and study residual stream basis elements as like layer outputs or something. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, you know, we were talking about being able to reuse things that you've learned before and not having to learn them again. And I guess I think of it as a kind of translational equivariance in the in the layer regime, which is that you have a computation which is learned early on, mm -hmm. and now it can just be composed into subsequent layers. It's yep. just it's like you've got a menu of computational functions yep. that you can call on at, at any layer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. I think of it as like the shared memory and shared bandwidth of the model. Yeah, yeah, almost like a memory bus. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes models will dedicate neurons to like cleaning up the memory and deleting things that are no longer needed. Yeah, yeah. And is there any interference in that memory bus? So much. Go on. Uh, this is the thing of superposition, right? Yeah. Like the residual stream is doing everything. It's like there's 50,000 input tokens start and then 4x as many neurons as residual stream dimensions in every MLP layer and attention heads moving everything around. And it's just a clusterfuck. What, what if you scale up the bandwidth of the bus? Mm -hmm. um, that is basically making the model bigger, right? Which we know makes models better. But I don't know, just thinking out loud, but what if you maintained the original dimensionality of the model, but you deliberately upscaled the bus? Um, so like you make the thing inside each layer smaller, but make the residual stream bigger? Or just make everything the same as mm -hmm. it is, but you just kind of like have a, a, a linear transformation on the bus and double the size of the bus? Um, so I don't think that would work without increasing the number of parameters. Because, like, if you, because like the thing that matters is the smallest bottleneck. Mm -hmm. The output width of an MLP layer are like four thousand by one thousand, and in order to make the one thousand bigger, you need more parameters. And so there's like all kinds of studies about the optimal hyperparameters and the optimal ratios. My general heuristic is number of parameters are the main thing that matters. I don't know. I don't spend that much time thinking about how to make models better. To be honest. I just yeah. want to understand them, goddammit. Yeah, because it's one of those things that it might remove bottlenecks because because essentially you're you're allowing the model to reuse things that it's learned previously. So now every single layer can specialize more than it did before. And that might mm -hmm. kind of like weirdly remove bottlenecks. Yeah. Yeah, the way I generally think about it is models are ensembles of shallow pods, which is this paper from like five years ago about resnets. Like, DPD too small is 12 layers. Um, each layer includes an, an attention block and an uh, attention bit and MLP, but it is not the case that most computation is 24 levels of composition deep. It is the case that most of them involve, like, I don't know, four. And they're just intelligently choosing which four and remixing them in interesting ways. And 
sometimes different things will want to like get to different points and so it's useful to have many layers rather than a few but also i don't know if you um have if you have the residual stream width and give the model 4x as many layers often performance is like about the same um or like not that different because the number of parameters is unchanged and this is just kind of a wild result about models that I think only really makes sense within this framework of it's like an ensemble of shadow paths and it's a trade-off between having more computation and having better memory bandwidth. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Okay, I mean, just to close, um, superposition, it might not be a new idea. So Yannick did a, mm-hmm. um, a paper video about this uh, paper called Super Masks in Superposition by mm-hmm. Mitchell Wardsman back in 2020. And he was talking about supermasks representing sparse uh, subnetworks in respect mm-hmm. of catastrophic forgetting and continual learning. But that was slightly different because that was an explicit model to perform masking, create subnetworks, and, and, and to, to model, um, you know, like basically a sparsity aware algorithm. But he was still using a lot of the same language like interference and so on and, and thinking about superpositions of subnetworks. Mm-hmm. And I guess the difference is, is like just as we were talking about with these inductive priors like transformers and, and CNNs, um, the models already do this stuff without us having to explicitly code it, which I think is the interesting discovery. Yeah. Yeah. One update I've made from Wes's work is that detokenization is probably like a pretty big fraction of what the early layers do. And it's just really easy to represent compound words in superposition because it's very binary. It's either there or not there. So alternating difference is easy to deal with. They're mutually exclusive, so there's no simultaneous interference. Like you cannot have Boris Johnson and Theresa May co-occur. Um, and you there's just like so many of them. Um, one fact about language models that people who haven't played around them may not appreciate is their inputs are these things called tokens. And tokenizers are fucked because they're trained in this bizarre Byzantine way that means that often words, the rarer words, will get broken up into many tokens. Yes. Multi-word phrases are always different tokens. Anything that's weird, like a URL, gets completely cursed. And... Um, Models don't want to have this happen. So they devote a bunch of parameters to build a like pseudo vocabulary of what's going on. And just returning to your point earlier about like, is it just these syntax level things? Is there some like actual more semantic stuff going on? Um, we did also have case studies looking at contextual neurons, things like this code is in Python, this language is in French. And these were seemingly monosemantic, like it seemed like there were specific neurons here. And we found things like if you ablate the French neuron, loss on French text gets much worse while other ones are fine. And also some interesting results that the model was, say, using this to disambiguate things, like tokens like D are common in German and also common in Dutch. And the neurons for those languages were being used to disambiguate for that token whether it was like a german d or a dutch d because they've got very different meaning in the two languages yeah i wonder if you can give mm-hmm. me some intuition like because as you say in, in wes's paper you know he did actually find that you know there are some monosemantic neurons like mm-hmm. french as you just said and in this case the model decided that interference in some sense wasn't worth the burden but what does burden mean here and mm-hmm. French is a very vague concept as well. (laughs) Yes. So, uh, all right, a couple of observations. First is I do not think we have properly shown they are monosemantic neurons. Um, We were looking, these models were trained on the pile, and we were specifically looking at them on Europal, which is like a data set of European Parliament transcripts which are labeled by language. And we found a neuron that seemed to strongly disambiguate French from non-French. But it was on this domain of parliamentary stuff. And because models really want to avoid simultaneous interference, if they did have superposition, they'd probably want to do it with something that isn't likely to co-occur in this context. I don't know, this is a list variable in Python, which we didn't check very hard for. And in particular, this is messy to check for 
Because in order to do that, you need to answer these questions like, what is French? Like, there's a bunch of English texts it will activate for, but it'll activate on words like sacre bleu and très bien. And I think I count this as French, but like, I don't have a rigorous definition of French. And I think an open problem I'd love to see someone pursue is just, can you prove one of these neurons is actually a French detecting neuron or not? And what would it even look like to do that? And yeah, regarding interference and the burden, so the way I think about it, if two features are not orthogonal, then, um, oh, no, sorry, this is more interesting in the case of neurons. If there's multiple things that could all activate a neuron, then it's harder for the downstream bit of the model to know how to use the fact that that neuron activated, because there are multiple things, even if they don't co-occur, because they're mutually exclusive. And this is just a cost. And there's a trade-off between having more features and not having this cost. And features like this is in French are really load-bearing. They're just really important for a lot of circuitry here. And so theoretically, the model might, might want to dedicate an entire neuron to this. But if you dedicate an entire neuron, you lose the ability to do as much superposition. My intuition is the number of features that can be represented in superposition is actually like grows more than linearly with the number of dimensions. So this might be like significantly worse than just having one fewer feature. So we are now in the next chapter of this beautiful podcast, and we're going to talk about transformers. So how exactly do transformers represent algorithms and circuits? And also, um, you've written this beautiful mathematical framework about transformers, which of course is um, working very closely with um, Catherine Olsen and, and Chris Ola. And Nelson Elhar. And, and, and Nelson, my, my apologies. Um, yeah, so... In terms of understanding, yeah. So if you want to do mechanistic interpretability in a model, you need to really deeply understand the structure of the model. What are the layers? What are the parameters? How do they fit together? What are the kinds of things that make sense there? And let's see. So... Yeah, there's like a couple of key things I'd want to emphasize from that paper, though, I don't know, it's also one of my like all-time top three interpretability papers, people should just go read it, and uh, after reading it, check out my three-hour video walkthrough about it, which apparently is most useful if you've already read the paper, because <laughs> it's that deep. Anyway, um, yeah, so a couple of things I'd want to call out from that, especially for people who are kind of familiar with other network but not transformers. The first, we've already discussed, the residual stream as the central object. And the second is how to think about attention. Because attention is the main thing which is weird about models. They have these MLP layers, um, which actually represent like two-thirds of the parameters in a transformer, which is often an underrated fact. But attention is the interesting stuff. So transformers have a separate residual stream for each input token. And this contains, like, all memory the model will to store at that position. Um, but MLP layers can only process information in place. You need attention to move things between positions. And classically, people might have used stuff like a 1D convolution. You average over 10 things in the sliding window. Um, this is baking in the inductive bias that nearby information is more likely to be useful. But... This is kind of a pretty limited bias to bake in. And the story of deep learning is that over time, people have realized, wait, we should not be trying to force the model to do specific things. We understand, we, we should not be telling the model how to do its job. If it has enough parameters and is competent enough, it can figure it out on its own. And so the idea here is rather than giving it a convolution, you give it this attention mechanism, where each token gets a query saying what it's looking for, each previous token gets a key saying what it has to offer, and the model looks from each destination token to the source tokens earlier on with the keys that are most relevant to the current query. And models 
And the way to think about an attention head, so attention layers break up into these distinct bits called heads, which act independently of the others and add to their outputs together, and just directly add to the residual stream. Uh, this is sometimes phrased as concatenate their outputs and then multiply by a map, but this is mathematically equivalent. Um, the Each head acts independently and in parallel, and further, you can think of each head as separately breaking down into a which information to move bit determined by the attention, which are determined by the query and key calculating matrices, and the what information to move once I know where I'm looking, which are determined by the value and output matrices. Um, we often think about these in terms of the QK matrix, WQ times WK transpose, and the OV matrix, uh, WO times WV, because there's no non-linearity in between. Um, and these two matrices determine like what the head does. And the reason I say these are kind of independent is that once the model has decided which source tokens to look at, the information that gets output by the head is independent of the destination token. And like the query only matters for choosing where to move information from. And this can result in interesting bugs. Like um, there's this motif of a skip trigram. The model realizes that, hmm, if, if the current thing is three and two has appeared in the past, then four is more likely to come next. If the current thing is three and four has appeared in the past, two is more likely to come next. But if you have multiple destination tokens that all want the same source token, for example, the phrase keep in mind can be a skip trigram. Um, really, it should be a trigram, but tiny models aren't very good at figuring out what's exactly the previous position. Keep at bay is another trigram, but in and at will both look at the same keep token. And so they must boost, boost both at and mind for both of them. So we'll also predict um, keep in bay and keep at uh, keep at mind. And yeah, and possibly we should move on to induction heads, which are a good illustrative example. I was yeah, I was going to come on to that. So on these induction heads, um, you've said that they seem universal across all models. They underlie more complex behavior like few shot learning they emerge in a phase transition and they're crucial for in, this in context learning and um, you said that sometimes specific circuits underlie emergent phenomena and you know we, we may want to predict or understand emergence by studying these circuits so what do we know so far a lot of questions in there all right all right okay. taking this in order so what is an induction head uh, I've already mentioned this briefly. Um, text often contains repeated subsequences, like after Tim, Scarf may come next, but if Tim Scarf has appeared like five times, then it's much more likely to come next. Um, in toy two-layer attention-only language models, we found this circuit called an induction head, which does this. It's a real algorithm that works on, say, repeated random tokens, and we have some mechanistic understanding of the basic form of it, where there's two attention heads and two different layers working together. Um, the, the later one, called an induction head, looks from Tim to previous occurrences of Scarf. Um, the first one is a previous token head, which on each Scarf looks at what came before, and is like, ah, this is a Scarf token which has Tim before, and then the induction head looks at tokens where the token before them was Tim, or where the token before them was equal to the current token. And when the attention, induction head decided to look at SCARF, the, which is determined purely by the QK matrix, it then just copies that to the output, which is purely done by the OV matrix. And I think induction heads are a really interesting circuit case study because induction heads are all of the interesting computation is being done by their attention pattern. Like, 
Tim Scarf could be anywhere in the previous context, and this algorithm will still work. And this is, like, important, because this is what lets the model do tracking of long-range dependencies in the text, where it looks far back. Um, and you can't bake this in with a simple thing like a convolutional layer. Um, in fact, transformers seem notably better than old architectures like LSTMs and RNNs, in part because they have induction heads that let them track long-range dependencies. And, yeah. Um, and more generally, it often is the case that uh, especially late-layer attention heads, the OV bit is kind of boring, it's just copying. But figuring out where to look is where all of the interesting computation lies. So, so first mm -hmm. of all, just to clarify, because people will know what an attention head is, but an induction mm -hmm. head is one of these circuits that that you're that you're talking about, just so people understand. And um, we should get onto this relationship between induction heads and the emergence of in-context learning. And also, you said it's very important that you know we have this scientific understanding, um, you know, w with respect to studying emergence, but rather that than just framing of interpretability kind of makes better models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, okay, so maybe I should first explain what emergence is. Let's do that. Um, yeah. in the, could you, I'd be really, really interested if you could just give me the simplest possible explanation of what you think emergence is. Sure. Emergence is when things uh, happen suddenly during training and go from not being there to being there fairly rapidly in a non-convex way, rather than gradually developing. Because it's interesting you said that, because I think of emergence as a surprising change in macroscopic phenomena, and it's an observer-relative term, which means it's it's always from the perspective of another scale. Hmm. So just a transient change in per in perplexity or so capability or something in my mind, wouldn't entail emergence. Like it would need to be some qualitative, meaningful thing, rather than just, oh, the loss curve got notably better in this bit. I think so. It's definitely related to some notion of surprise, mm -hmm. which is inherently relative. Um, yeah, let's not get hung up on that. So, yeah. okay, it's it's let's say it's a mm -hmm. transient change in something. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when you trans, it's like an unexpected sudden change. Though unexpected has so much semantic meaning on it that I don't want to use. But yeah, this is an infinite rabbit hole. Yes, but I, th I think um, the scale thing is, is relevant as well. So we are programming neural networks at the microscopic scale, and there's some macroscopic change in capability. So it's some... Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, and there's like lots of different dimensions you can have emergence on, you can have it as you train a model on more data, you can have it as you make the models bigger, and these are both interestingly different kinds. One of the more famous examples is chain of thought and few shot prompting, where GPT-3 is pretty good at this. Earlier models were not good at this. This was kind of surprising. Chain of thought is particularly striking because you... People just noticed a while after DP3 was public that if you tell it to think step by step, it becomes much better. Um, there's this recent innovation of tree of thoughts that I'm not particularly familiar with, but I understand is kind of like applying Monte Carlo tree search on top of chain of thoughts. Yes. Um, yes. Where you're like, well, there's many ways we could branch at each point. Let's use tree search algorithms to find the ultimate way of doing this. Yeah, but with, um, let's say, Scratchpad and Chain of Thought, I don't necessarily see that as an emergent... Cap well, maybe it is. Maybe there's an emergent reasoning capability that comes into play when you have a, a certain threshold size mm -hmm. model. But I think of it more as kind of having an intermediate augmented memory in the context. So you're, you're kind of mm -hmm. filling in a gap in cognition by saying you're allowed to... It's not just remembering things, it's also reflecting on things that didn't work. Yes. So, yeah, clarifying, when I say emergent, when I say chain of thought is an emergent property, I mean the capacity to productively do chain of thoughts yeah. is the emergent thing. Yeah. And yeah. telling the model to think step by step is a user-driven thing. 
Yeah. But I don't know. I kind of... Just as a point of order, though, mm-hmm. was it just that it was discovered after cha- after GPT-3 or would it work on GPT-2? Uh, I would have guessed it doesn't work very well on GPT-2, but I've not checked. I'd be pretty interested. I'm sure someone has looked into this. I haven't looked very hard. Uh, I guess, like, so a lot of my motivation for this work comes from I care a lot about AI X risk and AI alignment and how to make these systems good for the world. And when I see things like, oh, we've realized that you can make GPT-3 much better by te- asking it to think step by step, I'm like, oh no. Um, what kinds of things could the systems you make be capable of that we just haven't noticed yet? That's the concern that the, the genie's already out the bottle. And I mean, DeepMind just published this tree of thought paper. And it's a really simple idea basically a star search over trajectories of prompts and you use the the model itself to evaluate the value of a trajectory and i could have done that <laughs> anyone could have similar thing with auto gpt and all of this stuff. um i'm more skeptical than, than you are. I, I i think in the case of tree of thought it closes a capability gap in mm-hmm. respect of certain tasks which were not working very well because they don't have that kind of system to models don't seem to plan ahead very well but I still think that it, it's not just going to magically turn into super intelligent. I mean, we can mm-hmm. talk about this a little bit yeah. later, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I think this is also pretty relevant to like much more near-term risks. Like, yeah, I don't know. There's lots of things that a sufficiently capable model could do that might be pretty destabilizing to society, like write actually much better propaganda than human writers can or something. And if Tree of Thought makes it possible to do that in a way that we did not think was possible when GPT-4 was deployed. That's like an interesting thing that I care about noticing. It's not a very good example. but it Yeah, it is. Um, but being able to, I mean, first of all, it's been possible to create misinformation mm-hmm. for a long time. This is where I specified be able to do it notably better than humans can. I totally agree. The layer doing it a bit more cheaply and a bit more scale doesn't seem obviously that important. You could argue that, like, I don't know, being being a spam bot that feels indistinguishable from a human is like a more novel thing that's actually different. Yeah, but I don't know. This was yeah. like an off-the-cuff example. I don't want to get too deep into this because it's not a point I care that deeply about. Yeah, I mean, we we can come back to it in a bit, but I, I think yeah. we are nearly already there. Yeah, you know so, this irreversibility thing. We mm-hmm. we don't know. Uh, computer games are photorealistic. Chatbots are indistinguishable, and AI yeah. art is pretty much indistinguishable. And that could work. I mean, I spoke to Daniel Dennett about it last week, and he said he's really worried about the epistemic erosion of our society. More so, interestingly, than the ontological erosion. And I discovered later that's because he he's not a big fan of anything ontological. But um, yeah, it's, it is it is potentially a problem, but I guess to me, people might overestimate the scale and magnitude of change of, of this. I, I feel that, I know I don't want to echo Sam Altman here, but he said that we are reasonably smart people and, you know, we can, we can adapt and recognize, um, you know, deep fakes and so on. But yeah. Yeah. He's a complicated societal questions i guess i mostly just have the position of man it sure is kind of concerning that we have these systems that could potentially pose risks we don't know what they do and decide to deploy them and then we discover things they could do and i think that the research direction i'm trying to advocate for here is just better learn how to predict this stuff more than anything which hopefully we can all agree is like an interesting direction and there's all kind of debates about is emergent phenomena like actually a real thing? Like this recent is is this a Mirage paper, which I think was a bit overclaiming, but does make a good point that if you choose your metric to be sufficiently sharp, everything looks dramatic. Um, one thing I've definitely observed is if you have an accuracy graph with a log scale x-axis for grokking, it looks fantastically dramatic. And I was very careful to not do this in my paper because it is cheating. Um, but yeah, 
Um, so my particular hot take is that I believe emergence is often underlain by the model learning some specific circuit or some small family of circuits in a fairly sudden phase transition that enables this overall emergent thing. And this sequel paper led by Catherine Olson in context learning and induction heads is a big motivator of my belief for this. Hmm. So the idea of the paper is we have this, we found induction heads in these toy Taylor attentionally models. We somewhat mechanistically understood them, at least in the simplest case of induction. Um, we use this to come up with more of a behavioral test for whether it's induction head. You just give them all repeated random tokens and you look at whether it looks induction y. And we found that these occurred in basically all models we looked at, up to 13b, even though we didn't fully reverse engineer them there. And we then found that this was really deeply linked to the emergence of in context learning. There's a lot of jargon in there, so let's unpack that. In context learning, already briefly mentioned, it's like tracking long range dependencies in text, like you can use what was on, which was three pages ago, to predict what comes next in the current book, which is a non trivial thing. It is not obvious to me how I would program a model to do. In context learning is emergent. If you operationalize it as average loss on the 500th token versus average loss on the 50th token, there's a fairly sudden period in training where it goes from not very good at it to very good at it. Just a, a, mm -hmm. a tiny point of order there. One interesting thing about in-context learning is you're learning at inference time, not training time. Yes. But you're not changing anything in the underlying model, which means mm -hmm. anything it can do presumably must be materializing a competence which was acquired during training so it's coming back to this periodic table thing right so it's learned all these platonic primitives you do this in context learning you say i want you to do this here's an example and it kind of you know you've got all of these freeze-dried periodic computational circuits and they spring into life and they compose together and they do the thing yes yes yeah i think induction heads are to my eyes, the canonical example of an inference time algorithm stored in the model's weights that gets applied. And I'm sure there's a bunch more that no one has yet found. Um, and yeah, a lot of my model is that prompt engineering is just telling the model which of its circuits to activate and just engaging with various quirks of training that have made it more or less steerable in different ways. And yeah, so induction heads also emerge in a fairly sudden phase transition. And we, at exactly the same time, and we present a bunch more evidence in the paper that there's like actually a causal link here. Um, like one layer models have neither the in context learning or the induction heads phase chain because they can't do induction heads because they're only one layer. And why, but if you adapt the architectures, so they can form induction heads with only one layer. Now they have both of these phenomena. If you oblate induction heads, in contact learning gets systematically worse. And a particularly fun qualitative study was looking at soft induction heads, heads that seem to be doing something induction e in other domains, like a head which attends from the current word in English to the thing after the current word in French. Or more excitingly, a few shot learning head on this random synthetic pattern recognition task we made where it attended back to the most relevant examples to the current in, to the current one and my interpretation of all this is that there's something fairly fundamental about the induction -y algorithm for in context learning so the way i think about it let's say you've got two um you want to learn some relation you've got some local context A and some past context B. And if you observe A and you observe B in the past, this gives you some information about what comes next. Um, there's two ways this could work out. It could be symmetric, B helps A and A helps B, or asymmetric, B helps A, but A does not help B if they're the other way around. Mm -hmm. Asymmetric might be like knowing the title of a book tells you what comes next, but knowing what's in a random paragraph in the previous bit doesn't tell you the title. Um, while 
symmetric is like, I don't know, English sentence helps French sentence, French sentence helps English sentence. And if you have like N symmetric relations, like English, French, German, Dutch, Latin, whatever, where each of them helps each other, this is really efficient to represent. Because rather than needing to represent n squared different relations separately, like you would in the asymmetric case, you can just map everything to the same latent space and look for matches. And fundamentally, this is what induction heads are doing. They're mapping current token and previous token of thing in the past to the same latent space and looking for matches. And to me, this is just like a fairly natural primitive of attention. And this is exciting because, A, we found this deep primitive by looking at toy two-layer attentionally models. B, it was important for understanding and ideally for predicting the emergent phenomena of in-context learning. And um, two takeaways I have from this about work we should be doing. The first is we should be going harder at looking at toy language models. I open sourced a scan of 12 of them. And I'd love to see what people can find in one layer models with MLPs, because we really suck at transformer MLP layers, and one layer should just be easier than other ones. And the second thing is, I really want a better and more scientific understanding of emergence. Why does that happen? Really understanding particularly notable case studies of it, testing the hypothesis that it is driven by specific kinds of circuits, like induction heads, um, or at least specific families of circuits, even though, I don't know, you could argue that because we haven't fully reverse engineered the things in the larger models, we really know it's actually an induction head. And yeah, um, more generally, a lot of my vision for why Macintop matters is this kind of scientific understanding of models. Like, I don't care about making models better. But I care about knowing what's going to happen, knowing why stuff happens, achieving real understanding, and getting a scientific understanding of things like emergence seems like one of the things Mechantup might be uniquely suited to do, but also no one's checked very hard. And you, dear listener, could be the person who checks. So there was a paper by Kevin Wang et al. called Interpretability in the Wild, a circuit for indirect object identification in GPT-2 small, which found a circuit for indirect object identification. So um, they discovered um, backup name mover heads, which normally don't do much. They take over when the main name mover head are ablated. And they said uh, mechanistic interpretability as a validation set for more scalability uh, techniques. They've understood a clear place that these ablations can be misleading. So... Yeah. So yeah, bunch one pack in there. So I really like the interpretability in the wild paper. Mm. Uh, also, Kevin was only seventeen when he wrote it, and like, really? man, I was doing nothing remotely as interesting when I was in <laughs> high school. So props to him. Um, but uh, also a sign of how easy it is to pick low hanging fruit and do groundbreaking interpretability work. Um, wow. Such a young field. Um, I know it's so impressive. Yeah, I've just checked his Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, Kevin. And yeah, so to me, the underlying, yeah, so let's zooming out a bit. I think there's a family of techniques around causal interventions and their use in Mechantup that's useful to understand here. So the core technique is this, this idea of activation patching, where so let's, hmm. so one of the problems with understanding a model's features and circuits is models are full of many, many different circuits. Each circuit does not activate on many inputs, but each circuit will activate, uh, but on each input, many circuits will activate. And in order to do good mechanterp work, you need to be incredibly surgical and precise, which means you need to learn how to isolate a specific circuit. And... Let's consider a statement like um, uh, the Eiffel Tower is in Paris versus the Colosseum is in Rome. These are both, there's lots of features happening 
where there's lots of circuits being activated on the Eiffel Tower in Paris. This is an English. You are doing factual recall. You are outputting a location. You are outputting a proper noun. This is a European landmark, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And like, I want to know how the model knows the Eiffel Tower is in Paris, but the Colosseum is in Rome. Controls almost everything apart from the fact. And so, um, what I can try to do is causally intervene on the Colosseum run and replace, say, the output of an attention head with its output on the Eiffel Tower prompt and see how much this changes the answer from Rome to Paris. Mm. And this, um, yeah, this patch um, can let me really isolate how the circuitry for just this specific thing works. And there's all kinds of work around this, Obnoxiously, all of it uses different notation, like uh, resample ablations and causal tracing and causal mediation analysis and interchange interventions. Are all similar words for basically the same thing. Um, but yeah, um, the really key insight here is this kind of surgical intervention. Hmm. A classic technique in interpretability is ablations, where you just set something to zero. And it's kind of janky, because if you break something in the model, which wasn't interestingly used for the task, then everything dies. Or if you break it in interesting ways, everything dies. Uh, for example, in GPT-2 small, almost every single task breaks if you delete the zeroth MLP layer. Really? Um, yeah, as far as I can tell, the zeroth MLP layer is kind of an extended embedding. Um, GPD too small has tied embeddings and unembeddings, mm -hmm. so they're transposed of each other, which is wildly unprincipled in my opinion. And the model seems to be both using this for just detokenization and combining nearby things with the first attention layer, yep. uh, zeroth attention layer, and just undoing the tiedness. Um, but this means that basically everything is reading from that. And I've seen people do zero ablations and everything and be like, oh, this is an important part of the circuit. Let's get really sidetracked by this. Um, because the effect size is so big. Yeah. Oh, man, being a mech interpreter research fills my mind with such bizarre trivia like this. It's great. <laughs> Models, so bizarre. Um, and so, yeah. Um, this causal intervention, um, there's kind of two conceptually different kinds of interventions. You can take the Eiffel Tower prompt patch in something from the Colosseum and see if it breaks the ability to output Paris to verify which bits kind of are necessary, such that getting rid of them will break something. Or you can patch something from the Paris run into the Colosseum run and see if that makes it output Paris, which is testing for stuff that's sufficient. Um, I call the first one a resample ablation because you're messing up a component by resampling. And the second one... Um, denoising or causal tracing because you're intervening with like a bunch with like a bit of information and seeing if that is sufficient for everything else though none of these names are good i would love some to come up with better names and there's all kinds of families of work building on this like um i have this post called attribution patching that tries to apply this at industrial scale by using gradients to approximate it um which is fast enough that you could take GPT-3 and its 4 million neurons and do attribution patching on all neurons at once, on every position. Uh, great, great post. Redwood Research has this um, technique called causal scrubbing, yeah. which I view as uh, activation patching gone incredibly hard and rigorous that tries to come up with an automated metric for saying... Um, this hypothesis about a model is actually accurate for how it works, um, where it's kind of complicated, but the core idea is you think of a hypothesis as saying which resample ablations are allowed, hmm. and you make all of the resample ablations that should be allowed. Like, um, these components of the model shouldn't really matter, so we can just patch in stuff from random other inputs. Um, if you've got, say, an induction head, you might think... The induction head cares about the current token um, and the thing before 
the previous token, the thing before the past token that it's going to induct to, it's going to inductionally attend to. So let's replace the um, token that it's going to be attending to with a token from a different input, but with the same token before it. My hypothesis about the induction head says this should be allowed, so let's do that. I wouldn't want to yeah. induce a rant, but the, the metric he uses is really important. Right? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, this is one of my hobby horses. So um, some of the original work looking at the patching stuff, like David Bao and Kevin Meng's excellent uh, Rome paper, uses the probability of Paris as their metric. And there are other papers that use things like accuracy as their metric. And generally, I think of metrics as being on a spectrum from, like, soft to sharp. So, generally, I think of models as thinking in log space. Um, they are kind of acting like Bayesians. They um, are trying to figure out something's in Paris, and there'll be five separate heads that each contribute one to the correct logit. And each of these can be thought of as, like, one bit of information and together, they get you the right probability of, say, 0.8. But if you patch in each one in isolation, the probability changes negligibly, because probability is exponential in the log logits. So if you're using probability, you're like, oh, this, this head patch doesn't really matter. And so in this paper, they did this thing of patching in like 10 adjacent layers at once. And to me, a really core principle of this kind of causal intervention and mechanistic technique, that you want to be as surgical as possible, to be as deeply faithful as possible to what the neural model is actually doing. So in this case, there was an interaction between them. They were effectively mm -hmm. making several interactions or interventions mm -hmm. at once. Um, yes. Yeah, they were like replacing 10 adjacent layers and uh, no, patching things in different layers is always a bit weird. Uh, I don't think that part's that objectionable. I mostly just feel like if you choose a metric like log prop, it allows you to be much more surgical about how you intervene. Hmm. Uh, oh, it, it allows you to identify subtle effects of things. Accuracy is even worse because accuracy is basically rounding things to zero or one. So like if the threshold is 2.5, any individual patch does nothing. Hmm. Any resample ablation does nothing. Um, but if you patch in, like, the 10 adjacent layers, it will do everything. And this can be kind of misleading. Uh, another one I often see people do is um, they're trying... They look at things like the, the rank of an output. Like, at which point does the model realize Paris is the most likely next token? And this can be super misleading because... This will make you think the third head is the only head that matters. Um, when really, all five of them matter, the order is kind of arbitrary. And yeah, I've seen papers that I think got somewhat misled by using metrics like this. And ah, metrics, they matter so much. It's so easy to trick yourself. My high level pitch is just, Macintop is great. Macintop is beautiful. Also, the field is incredibly young. There's maybe 30 full-time people working on it in the world. There's a ton of low-hanging fruits. I've done major research in this field. I've been in it for like less than two years. Um, I would love people to come and help and help us solve problems and do research here. And we'll link to my post on getting started and my sequence called 200 Concrete Open Problems in the description to this, hopefully. And of yeah, I think there's just, it's not that hard to get started. It's really fun. Hopefully I've nerd sniped you with at least one thing in this podcast. And if you're at least vaguely curious, it's just really easy to open one of the tutorials linked in my posts and just start screwing around. And I'd love to see what you can find. Beautiful. Um, also, the DeepMind alignment team is currently hiring and people should apply which includes hiring for our mechanistic interpretability team. Amazing. Do they have to do leak code? Uh, I have no idea. Can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, we did an amazing video with uh, Petr Velichkovic. Um, I gave him one of my leak code challenges and annoyingly he aced it. 
Oh, I'm so, so, so sorry. It's all, of that, it's all that deep mind interview, interview practice. Anyway, okay, let's talk about superintelligence. Now, um, I spoke with um, our mutual friend, Robert Miles, about a month ago. Rob's so great. He's, he's a lovely chap. Spoke all about alignment. And uh, he accused me of over-philosophying everything because I was talking all about intelligence, one of my favorite topics. And he said, well, what about fire? <laughs> fire is something that people didn't understand millennia ago, but they knew that it burnt and they knew that it was bad. And this is like this is like a fire which is very interesting. And maybe we can bring in a little bit of effective altruism as well. Yes. So, um, you know, it, I... If I can just uh, please, please do, please. If there is one thing I have learned from the past decade of machine learning progress, it is that you do not need to understand a thing in order to make it. And yeah. this extends to things that are smarter than us and which are capable of leading to catastrophic risks. Yes, yes. Well, let, let's... um. I'll, I'll step but. back a, a tiny bit and then we'll, and then we'll mm. get there because there, there's the hypothetical nature, which mm -hmm. I guess I have a, mm. a bit of a problem with. Now, about 10 years ago, I was one of the first supporters of Sam Harris's podcast and, and he's mm. quite aligned to EA. And um, he was talking about um, this very noble idea that everyone matters equally and people on the left should get on board with that intrinsically. Mm. And this idea that we should quantitatively analyze the impact of charity work and solve an optimization problem and earning to give and a lot of the stuff that um, McCaskill spoke about and also philosophers like Peter Singer. And the focus seemed to be primarily on alleviating poverty, which we and we are we don't say the biggest problem. We say a problem. This is another thing uh, our friend Robert Miles said. He said, the problem is when people talk about the problem, there can be more than one problem, <laughs> but, but anyway, so um, it's a big it's a big problem. And um, recently, you and I can agree that EA circles have really laser focused in on existential risk from AI, as opposed to other more plausible X risk concerns like pandemics or even nuclear war. I'm not not to say that they don't focus on that, but. I am going to push back on other more plausible X risks. Go on, go on. Uh, I just wanted to register an objection. Okay, Feel okay. free to Re go. Register it. Okay. <laughs> so, and you know, cynically, from from my point of view, I see, I see the influence of Eliezer, Bostrom, Hansen, etc., kind of shifting the the focus onto X risk. And part of part of the reason for that is also this kind of overly intellectual focus on long termism. And it's done in a very intellectualized way. So it's based on the utility function now incorporating future simulated humans on different planets, you know, a long time away in the future and making all of these intellectual jumps. So let's let's start there. What's your all take? Right. So much stuff to respond to in there. Good. So, all right, a couple of things. Uh, the first... So, Cards on the table. Um, I care a lot about AI existential risk. Yes. The reason I work on mechanistic interpretability is because I think that understanding the mysterious black boxes that are potentially smarter than us and may want things wildly different than what we wanted them to want is just clearly better than not understanding them. Yes. And I think mechanistic interpretability is a promising path here. So, and... I also would consider myself an effective altruist and a rationalist. So, mm -hmm. cards on the table, those are my biases. Um, so, I generally think it's more productive to discuss, is AI catastrophic and existential risk a big deal? Then is it the biggest deal? Or is it worth more resources on the margin than global poverty? Or climate change? Or AI ethics? And like, there's just lots of problems. I care way more about convincing people that AI extras could be in your top 10 than it should be in your top one. Because I feel like for most people, it's not in their top thousand. And there's just so much That's divisiveness fun. between, say, the AI ethics community and the AI alignment community about whose problem is a bigger deal. And like, both are big problems. Why are we arguing? And well, part yeah. of this is about are moral intuitions mm -hmm. and this is something i spoke a lot with connor about you know he mm -hmm. said that in many ways he's got this technical empathy so 
sensory empathy is I really care about my family. They're these concentric circles of moral status. I really care about my family. Mm -hmm. And if I try really hard, I can care about people in other countries and so on. And then if I try really, really hard, I can care about future simulated lives on Mars. Mm -hmm. And Connor said, the idea of this movement is about galaxy braining yourself into being the most empathetic person imaginable. But it's a kind of empathy that people don't understand. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So a separate bit of beef I have is with the entire notion of long-termism. Right. So long-termism is this idea... Uh, okay. So long-termism is generally caring about the long-term future. Yeah. There's like the strong form of value in the future basically entirely dominates things today. And weaker forms of just this really, really matters. And... Um, a common misconception about AI X risk and AI safety is that you should only work on this if you are a long-termist. That, you know, it's a one in a billion chance of mattering, but there's um, a quintillion future lives that this outweighs everyone alive today in moral worth. Or, well, we're only going to get AGI in like 500 years, but we're going to work on it now just in case. And, like, I think both of these are just nonsense. Um, like, I guess as a concrete example, um, effective altruists have worked on pandemic prevention for many years. And I think it was just clearly the case that pandemics are a major threat to people alive today. And I like to feel that we've been proven right. No one's going to argue at that point. <laughs> and, you know, everyone's being like, effective altruists, why are you working on AI safety? This obviously it doesn't matter um you know i feel like we got one thing right um can, but... I, can i be really skeptical mm -hmm. though for a second because i mean you're working for deep mind mm -hmm. it, there's so much prestige and money attached to ai risk mm -hmm. elon musk is talking about it all the time whereas you could be a scientist working on pandemic response mm -hmm. responses and it just, i mean let's be honest it wouldn't be anywhere near the same level of prestige yeah so couple of takes it definitely is the case that i a good chunk of why i personally am working on ai x risk rather than say bio x risk is that i'm a smart mathematician i like ai i like mech and Turp. i do not think i would be good at biology in the same way and i also would personally assert that ai x risk is more important and like more pressing but you know i'm biased and i think it's fair to flag that bias um in terms of prestige so i've only really been working on this stuff properly for the past two and a half years which is i mean it's changed dramatically like in the last six months we've gone from well are we really ever going to get agi to oh my god gpt4 exists jeffrey hinton has left google to loudly advocate for x risk Joshua Bengio is now loudly advocating for X risk. It's two thirds of the Turing winners for deep learning. You'll, you'll never get the third one. Uh, yeah, we're never going to get the third one. <laughs> <laughs> Jan LeCun yeah. has made his position very, very clear. Yes. Um, but, you know, it's a majority. I'll take it. Yes. And or, or the fourth one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's coming on our podcast, actually. Uh, oh, who was the fourth one? Uh, Schmidt Huber. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it seems hard. Oh, I'm very curious to hear the Schmidt Hero episode. Oh, yeah. He's even more virulently against than Jan, I'm wow. afraid to say. So oh, two out of two. Two out of four. I'm, I'm interested to hear it. Anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, yeah. In terms of prestige, I don't know. I gather that, say, seven years ago, it was basically just not it would be like pretty bad for your career you would not be taken seriously if you mentioned caring about ai x risk your papers would be rejected i hear a story of um stuart russell at one point talked to a grad student of his about how stuart was concerned about ai x risk the grad student was also really concerned and freaking out but they'd been working together for years and neither had felt comfortable mentioning it and a lot of people who are still in the field were doing this stuff then which makes me somewhat reject the prestige argument at least for senior people in the field i think there's a difference with stuart russell in particular he's very credible mm -hmm. and 
he... that I'm not. Oh, I didn't mean I didn't mean you. I was talking. <laughs> I was talking about the two mm -hmm. um, Godfather because the the thing mm -hmm. that um, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I was surprised that Benjio and Hinton came out in the way they did, and I. I, the reason I didn't like what they said was I felt that they were implying that current AI technology could pose an existential threat. And what I'm getting from you and what I'm getting from Russell is, and also from Robert Miles, is that this is a very real potential um, mm -hmm. threat in the future, but it's not a current threat. Mm -hmm. Yes, very real potential threat in the future, though I hesitate to confidently assert, say, this will not be a threat in the next five years or something. It's like pretty hard to say. Interesting. Um, I'm not confident I agree with your assessment of Bangio and Hinton, though they've spoken a bunch publicly, so I'll defer if you can point to specific writings. But for example, Bangio signed the pause AI for six months, more yeah. powerful than GPT-4 letter. And I don't know. I don't think the letter was asserting that the letter definitely wasn't asserting GPT-4 was an existential risk. It wasn't confidently asserting GPT-5 would be, but just being like, yeah, we need more time and slow down and caution. It's, yeah, maybe I'm yeah. reading too much into that, but it mm -hmm. seemed to me that, I mean, um, Hinton said that ChatGPT now contains all of the world's knowledge mm -hmm. and this chatbot knows everything and mm -hmm. it could potentially do very harmful things. And I, I interpreted it possibly incorrectly mm -hmm. that they were talking about reasonably current mm -hmm. or next generation risks fair i mean i can't talk for them i also i don't know there are lots of near-term risks there's long-term risks i consider it my job to think hard about the long-term risks and try to guard against those yeah and i think lots of other people's jobs is to focus on like the near-term risks and both are like great forms of work um i don't know one reason i like interpretability is i think it is just broadly useful across all of them so what I consider it for my job might just not even matter. Yes. But yes. yeah. Um, yeah, no. I probably will not do not want to get deeply into interpreting what other people have said. Um I yeah. Well, could I could I ping you just a couple of quick questions? So first of all, you know, there's this idea of negative utilitarianism. I mean, do you think minimizing suffering is more important than maximizing happiness? Mm, nah. No? I'm not sure I've got a more deep answer than that. I mostly think a lot of this intuitive reasoning is more driven by intuition than anything else. But it's a bit like this metrics thing we were talking mm -hmm. about, you know, which which is that did, did, if you want to have, delicious. would you like to tolerate some spiky negs for some average happiness? <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. I have like a general frustration with these discussions getting too philosophical. Um, this okay, is a big best. issue when I hang out with effective altruists who really love moral philosophy and population ethics. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I have this EA forum post called Simplify EA Pictures to Holy Shit X Risk. I'm just like, so I don't know. Um, if you actually look at some of the concrete work people try doing on things like timelines and risk, there's this uh, report from Ajaya Kotra at Open Philanthropy that gives a 30-year median timelines to trans to AI that's transformative, uh, which he since updated to 20 years. There's a report by Joseph Carl Smith that estimates about a 10-ish percent chance of a major catastrophe from this. Yeah. And if you just take those numbers, this is clearly enough to reach pretty high in my list of concerns of people alive today. Okay, okay. And I think these are bold empirical claims, and I think it's great to debate them in the empirical domain, but to me this doesn't feel like a moral question. It just feels like from common sense assumptions, if you believe these empirical claims, this stuff is a really big deal. Okay, okay. Let, let's, let's take another couple of steps. So first of all, we, we save this till later. Um, I think deception is very important. Mm -hmm. And Daniel Dennett, when I spoke with him, he uses this notion called the intentional stance, which mm -hmm. basically means that if you use a projection mm -hmm. of purposes, goals, agency, etc., in order to understand the behavior of an agent, possibly mm -hmm. a simulated agent, then for all intents and purposes, 
it it has agency it can make mm-hmm. decisions it has moral status it has lots of different things like that mm-hmm. and he would say that without an intentional stance without agency it's impossible for a model to lie or deceive us now what do you think would be the bar for something like a gpt model to deceive us and why yeah so before i give takes i will generally reinforce rob's vibe of well if you have no idea how fire works but you know that it burns you that's kind of the important thing like maybe a model has just this random learned adaptation to output things that are designed to get a user to feel and believe a certain way that isn't intentional and isn't deceptive in some true cog sense but it's like enough for this to be a big deal that we should care a lot about okay, okay. with that I mean, with that aside yeah um yeah so i'm definitely hesitant to ascribe an overly confident view of what's going on here um and i think lots of early discourse on alignment around things like utility maximization and around things like these things are just paperclip maximizers etc is kind of misleading and i don't think it is an accurate model of how gpd7 rlhf plus 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 is going to work well that's my prediction um one thing that is pretty striking to me is i just feel like we're pretty confused on both sides of this like I do not feel like I can confidently claim that these models will demonstrate anything remotely like goals or intentions, but I also don't feel like you can confidently claim that they won't. And I'm not talking like 99.99% confidence, I'm talking like 95% plus confidence either way. And one of my visions for what being good at Macintop might look like is being able to actually get grounding for these questions. Hmm. Because I think ultimately these are mechanistic questions behavioral interventions are not enough to answer like does this thing have a goal in any meaningful sense but yeah my like very rough soft definition would be is the model capable of forming and executing long-term plans towards some goal potentially if explicitly prompted to like auto gpt or just spontaneously is it capable of actually carrying out these plans and does it form and execute plans towards some objective that is like encoded in the model somewhere um and i don't know i think it's pretty plausible that the first dangerous thing is like chaos gpt7 where (laughs) someone tells it to do something dangerous and it gets misused more so than it's like misaligned and i care deeply about both of these risks okay so yeah, first one's more of a governance question than a technical question, and thus is less where I feel like I can add value. So I agree with you on all of that. So yeah, being less confused about what's going on inside the models and it's great. You know, using interpretability to figure out whether they actually do have agency or goals, and sometimes they do the right things for the wrong reasons. Auditing models um, that seem aligned before they're deployed is something that you've, you've told me before. It's so great. And, um, you know, just being able to check more deeply that it truly is aligned. But I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, this interesting paper from Katya Grice. Mm-hmm. So she wrote a response called, it was on Less Wrong, Debunking the AI Apocalypse, a comprehensive analysis of counter arguments to the basic AI risk case, X risk. And the reason I read it is um, so many of the comments were destroying uh, me and Doug after we interviewed Rob. And they said, well, if, if you're going to criticize X risk, I mean, at least go and read Katya Grace's response. So I did. So I did. Here we go. So uh, she oh, she basically made two big counter arguments that intelligence mm-hmm. might not actually be a huge advantage and, and about the speed of, of um, growth is, is ambiguous. But I first want to touch on what you said before, which is about this notion of goal directedness. Mm-hmm. So alignment people say that if superhuman AI systems are built any given system is likely to be goal directed and the orthogonality thesis and instrumental goals are cited as aggravating factors Mm -hmm. and um, the goal directed behavior is likely to be valuable so economically 
goal-directed entities may tend to arise from machine learning training processes not intending to create them, which is kind of talking about some of the emergent behaviors that we were talking about earlier with respect to Othello, for example. And coherence arguments may imply that systems with goal-directedness will become more strongly goal-directed over time, which is apparently something that is argued for. So I'm thinking, what does goal even mean? I mean, we, we anthropomorphize abstract human intelligible concepts like goals, and they they emer- they really are emergent because they emerge from these low level interactions in the cells in your body, and then you get these things that we recognize to be goals, observer relative, as we were talking about before. But they're just graduated phenomena from smaller things, right? Mm-hmm. So, what does it even mean to have a goal? Yeah. So, couple of thoughts on that. Again, you ask questions with a lot of content in them. Um, no problem. I can only, I can only apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as someone who accidentally writes nineteen thousand blog per thirteen thousand word blog posts all the time, I relate. Um, anyway, so. <laughs> What am I saying? Um, so the well, way... Yeah, it's a vague concept, right? Yeah. yeah. So I definitely want to try to take... So there's the mechanistic definition of yeah. the model forms plans and it evaluates the plans according to some criteria or objective. Yeah. And it executes the plans that score better on this. And... I would love if we get to a point where we can look inside a model and look for circuitry that could be behind this or not. Um, That would feel like a big milestone for me on, wow, I really believe Macintop will matter for reducing catastrophic risk from AI. Um, A second thing is that, um, yeah, the kind of more behavioral thing of the model systematically takes actions that pushes the world towards a certain state. And I don't want... I think there's a common problem in alignment arguments where people get too precise and too specific in a way that lots of people reasonably object to and a way which is not necessary for the argument. Um, there's a really great paper called The Alignment Problem from a Deep Learning Perspective by mm. Richard No. Yep. Lawrence Chan and Sora Minderman. Yep. And this is probably my biggest recommendation for the listening audience of what I think is like a pretty well-presented case for alignment. And I generally pretty pro trying to make the minimal necessary assumptions. So for me, it's kind of like some soft form of goal-directedness of take actions that push the world towards a certain state. And another important thing is... There are a bunch of theoretical arguments for why goals would spontaneously emerge. Um, ideas around inner misalignment uh, from work led by Evan Huminger. Um, ideas around just coherence theorems and things like that, mm-hmm. which I don't know I find like a bit convincing, not that convincing. But then there's things will have goals because we try to give them goals, and I'm like, yeah, that's probably going to happen. <laughs> um it's just clearly useful if you have uh if you want to have an ai ceo or a ai helping run logistics for military operations to have something that's capable of forming and executing long-term plans towards some objective and if you believe this is what's going to happen then the key question is are we capable of ensuring those goals are exactly the goals we would like them to be and my answer for any question of the form, can we precisely make sure the system is doing exactly X of machine learning, is God no. We are not remotely good enough to achieve this with our current level of alignment and steering techniques. And to me, this is like a more interesting point where it's not quite a crux for me, but it just seems like a lot easier to argue about. Okay. Will people do this? Yeah, it's essentially. I mean, Katia herself said that it's um, it's unclear that goal directedness um, is favoured by economic pressure, to training dynamics, or coherence arguments. You know, whether those are the same thing as kind of goal directedness that implies a zealous drive to control the universe. And look at South Korea; they they have goals, mm-hmm. and those goals, I, I don't really subscribe to the um, to the dictator 
view of society, mm-hmm. I assume they are somehow emergent. Mm-hmm. Yes. And similarly... Sorry, I'm, sorry South Korea or North Korea? Uh, sorry, North Korea. Did I say yeah, South Korea? Yeah, cool. I meant, I okay. meant yeah, North Korea. Sorry. <laughs> Very different Koreas. Yeah. Different, different goals. <laughs> different goals. But, um, but, but you can think about goals in, a, in an AI system as either being ones which emerge from some mm-hmm. low level um, or ones which are explicitly coded by us or ones which are instrumental, mm-hmm. right? And these are all a whole bunch of goals. Yep. But we can't really control those. We can add pressures. How do we control what North Korea does? Uh, that sure is a question I'd love for someone to answer. Um, I, I don't know. I like I can give speculation. There's like there's the question of in practice, what do people do? which is basically reinforcement learning from human feedback. Um, And I expect people would apply that in this situation as well. I definitely do not believe we would be able to explicitly encode a goal in the system. Mm -hmm. Um, Moreover, even if you can encode, even if you could give some like scoring function, like make the score in this game high, this does not give you a model that intrinsically cares about that in the same way that... I don't know. Evolution optimizes inclusive genetic fitness. I don't give a fuck about inclusive genetic fitness. Even though I care about a bunch of things evolution got me to care about within that, like tasty foods and surviving. Um, Yeah, so we don't know how to put goals into systems. I basically just assert that we are not currently capable of putting goals into systems well. And this is one of the main things the field of element thinks about. And we're not very good at it. And it'd be great if we were better at it. Um, in terms of... Yeah. I definitely don't want to make strong claims about... To be dangerous, the goals need to be coherent. Or the goals need to... There needs to be like a singular goal. Like, I don't have a singular goal. Um, it's not obvious to me how these systems will turn out. If they don't, in any meaningful sense, want a coherent thing, then I'm a fair bit less concerned. Though, well, I mean, there's many, many ways that human-level AI would be good for the world or bad for the world, or just wildly destabilizing and high variance, of which misalignment risk is one of them. And lots of the other ones would still apply, like misuse and systemic risks. But leaving those aside, um, yeah, I think if a model is just roughly pushing in a goal-directed direction with a bunch of caveats and uncertainties and flip-flopping. That still seems like a pretty big deal to me. Okay. Okay. Katia, um, let's just cover her two main arguments. So she said that intelligence might not actually be a huge advantage. So looking at the world, um, intuitively, big discrepancies in power are not to do with intelligence. And she said, um, IQ human, you know, humans with an IQ of 130 earn roughly 6,000 to 18,000 a year dollars more than average IQ humans. Elected representatives are apparently slightly more smarter, uh, slightly smarter on average, but not a radical difference. Mensa isn't a major force in the world. (laughs) And um, if we look at people who evidently have good cognitive abilities, given their intellectual output, their personal lives are not obviously drastically more successful anecdotally. So is it that much of a big deal? Yeah. So I think this is like a fair point. Um, If we looked in the world and um, IQ or whatever metric of intelligence you want to use um, clearly dramatically correlated with everything good about someone. I mean, IQ correlates with like basically everything you might value in someone's life because we live in an unfair world, but not dramatically. Um, Yeah, so I think this is a valid argument. I generally don't think you should model human-level AI as, like, IQ, or, like, slightly superhuman AI as, like, an IQ 200 human. Like, for example, GPT-4. I would argue, knows most facts on the internet. Or many facts. Um, And, yeah, knows many facts. And this seems... (laughs) 
Um, GPT-4 knows many facts, and this is sure an advantage over me. Uh, GPT-4 knows how to write a lot of code, and it knows how to take software and do penetration testing on it. It knows lots of social conventions and cultural things, and has lots of experience reading various kinds of text written to be manipulative, or manuals on how to make nuclear weapons. Sorry, I'm, mostly go I'm going too hard on the knowledge point. There's just lots of different axes you can be human level or better, in of which knowledge is one, intelligence and reasoning is one, social manipulation abilities is another, charisma and persuasion is another. I think these two are particularly important ones. Um, there's forming coherent plans, there's just like the ability to execute on stuff 24-7, running thousands of copies of yourself in parallel, distributed across the world, uh, there's running faster than humans, and there's just like lots of dimensions here. I think the IQ 200 human frame is helpful in some ways, but unhelpful in other ways, especially if it summons the like nerdy scientist with no social skills whose life is a mess archetype. I say it's a nerdy scientist with no social skills whose life is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean that this is this is the thing is um because Rob said the same thing. On on chess it's possible for someone to be literally 20 times better than you that there's a huge dynamic range of skill and that's something we've not really seen in human intelligence and it might be because of the way we measure it it's possible that the way we measure it doesn't even capture people with with mm -hmm. with um you know broader or better abilities mm -hmm. let's just um cover her her last point quickly so this is that the the speed of intelligence growth is ambiguous so this idea that AI would be able to rapidly destroy the world seems prima facie unlikely to Katya, since no other entity has ever done that. <laughs> and well, she goes on. So uh, the two common broad arguments is that there'll be a feedback loop in which intelligent AI makes more intelligent AI repeatedly until AI is very, very intelligent. Number two, small differences in brains seem to correspond to very large differences in performance based on observing humans and other apes. Thus, you know, any movement past human level would take us to unimaginably superhuman level. Mm -hmm. And the basic counter arguments to that is that, you know, the feedback loops might not be as powerful as assumed. There could be diminished returns, there could be resource constraints, and there could be complexity barriers. So maybe we should just do that kind of recursive mm -hmm. self-improving piece first. What do you think about that? I don't really buy recursive self-improvement. Oh, good. It's not an important part of why I'm concerned about this stuff. Um, I <clears throat> So, generally, I just feel like a lot of the arguments were made before the current paradigm of enormous foundation models. When you're investing yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars of compute into a thing, it's pretty hard for it to make itself substantially better. Um, and you can do things like design better algorithmic techniques... I think that is probably one that is more likely to be accelerated the better the model gets. Um, it's not sh clear to me how much how much juice there's to squeeze out of that. Um, and yeah, um, but generally, I just think a lot of this is going to be bottlenecked by hardware and compute and data, such that I'm like less concerned about some run runaway intelligence explosion. And I'm more just concerned about, we'll eventually make things that are dangerous. What do we do then? Okay. And I, I think this this is like a really good fact about the world. I think a world where you can have intelligence explosions is really scary. And I feel like our current world is a lot less scary than it could have been. If some kid in a basement somewhere just like wrote the code for AGI one day. Yes. Yes. Okay, well, I mean, just just to finish off Katya's fin final point. So the the other point they made was about small differences mm -hmm. might lead to over. It's a little bit like in squash. Uh, I don't know if you've ever played squash, no. but a tiny difference in ability leads to one player overwhelmingly dominating the other player because you just get these kind of like mm. you know it's a game of attrition and you get these tipping points. And she argued that that might not necessarily be the case when comparing AI mm -hmm. systems. 
because of three reasons. Different architectures, likely to have very different underlying architectures and biological brains, which could lead to different scaling properties. Mm -hmm. Performance plateaus. So um, there might be these plateaus beyond which further increases in intelligence, you know, don't lead to significant performance improvements. Mm -hmm. And also this notion of task specific intelligence, something that I strong, I believe that all intelligence is specialized as we were speaking about earlier. Um, so it might be specialized rather than being generally intelligent and small differences thus may not translate into large differences in performance across a wide variety of tasks. Maybe we should just touch on this, mm -hmm. on this kind of task focus thing. So I think humans are very specialized. We have, and we don't realize that we are because the mm -hmm. way we conceive of intelligence is anthropomorphic, but actually we, d we don't do four dimensions very mm -hmm. well. There's lots of things that we don't do very well. And we're kind of embedded in the cognitive ecology in quite a complex way. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? Yeah. So I will, okay. I'll first comment on the general meta dynamic of, I think that people get way too caught up on philosophizing and I'm no so offense, sorry. And <laughs> <laughs> in particular, I care about whether an AI will cause a catastrophic risk. Yeah. I don't care about whether it fits into, whether it's general in the right way, whether it has weaknesses in certain areas, whether it's uh, high on the Chomsky hierarchy, or <laughs> whether it's generally intelligent in some specific sense that someone like Gary Marcus would agree with. Is, is that in any way a contradiction of your m mechanistic sensibilities? Mm -hmm. Because when it comes to neural networks, <laughs> You want to understand how they work, but when it comes to intelligence, you don't. Oh, sorry. I want to understand how it works. I want to understand everything. Um, I just don't think it's... I want to disentangle things to be concerned about from theoretical arguments about whether this fits into certain categories. For the purposes of deciding whether to be concerned about AI existential risk, I see all of the theory arguments as like a means to an end of this ultimate empirical question of, is this a thing that could realistically happen? And I think that these quite, these theor theoretical frameworks do matter. Like, I don't know. I think that an image classification model is basically never going to get the point where it's dangerous, while a language model that's being RLHF'd to have some like notion of intentionality <clears throat> potentially will um and yeah i don't know i can give like random takes but to me if you're like hey guys can be task specific in the same way that humans are task specific i'm like well a human is task general enough that i think they could be massively dangerous in the right situation with the right um advantages like if they wanted to be and were able to run the thousands copies of themselves at a thousand x speed or something i don't know if that's actually a remotely accurate statement about models probably they can run many copies but not at thousand x speed or something but um yeah generally that's the kind of question i care about and i'm concerned many of these definitions lose sight of that and part of my thing of like I want to keep alignment arguments as having as few assumptions as possible, because the more assumptions you make, the less plausible your case is, and the less and like the more room there is for people to like rightfully disagree. And like, I want to be careful not to make any of the case rest on like strong theoretical frameworks, because we don't know what we're doing here enough to have legit theoretical frameworks. And I think that AI is likely to be limited in the same way that humans are, at least within the GPT paradigm, because if you're training it to predict the next word on the internet and a bunch of other stuff, then it's going to learn a lot from human patterns and human thought and human conventions. But, I don't know. In, in closing, um, you said that your personal favorite heuristic is the second species argument. Can, can yeah. you can you tell us? Yeah, so um, I quite like Hinton's recent pithy quote of there is no example of 
something being of some entity being controlled by things less smart than it. And that was terrible. Uh, sorry? I really, well, I mean, um, Twitter went wild over that. Oh, they're trying to go wild. Yeah, because if you, I mean, look at and look at a company. The, the, the CEO is usually dumber than you. You have to hire competent people to have a, a successful company. Or um, look, look at my cat. Yeah. Okay. Fair. This is a I'm terrible phrasing. Here, by the Let's way. just start again. <laughs> um, all right. So, <clears throat> yeah, this is often called the gorilla problem. Right. Humans are just smarter than gorillas in basically all ways that matter. Humans are not actively malevolent to gorillas, but ultimately, humans are in charge, gorillas are not, and gorillas exist because of our continued benevolence or ambivalence. And it just seems to me like if you are creating entities that are smarter than you, the default outcome is they end up in control of what's going on in the world and you do not. And I kind of just feel like this should be the null hypothesis. And then there's a bunch of arguments on top of like, is this a good model? Will, obviously there's lots of disanalogies because we're making them. We ideally have some control over them. We're going to try to shape them to be benevolent towards us. But this just seems like the default thing to be concerned about to me. On that point though, we are different from computers. Mm -hmm. We scuba dive. Mm -hmm. And that's actually quite a profound thing to say. We scuba dive because we are we are integrated into the into the ecosystem not just physically but cognitively there's a kind of cognitive ecosystem that we're enmeshed in mm -hmm. we have a huge advantage over computers mm -hmm. computers can't really do anything in the physical world um so i agree with this but i don't know i feel like the way i don't know one evocative example is there was this crime lord el chapo who ran his gang from within prison for like many years very successfully um when you have humans in the world who can get to do things for you you don't need to be physically embodied to get shit done and i don't know, just look at blake lemoyne there's no shortage of people who will do things if convinced in the right way even if they know it's an ai and i do agree with you on that and i think Part of the reason why we're going to have the inevitable proliferation of this technology mm -hmm. is so many tinkerers will just create many, many different versions of AI and yep. they won't really be thinking about the consequences of their actions. Mm -hmm. But what's the alternative? Paternalism? Yeah, so to me, the main interesting thing here is large training runs as like the major bottleneck very few actors can do them we're probably going to get beyond the point where people are even putting the things out behind an api open to many people to use let alone like open sourcing the weights which we've already pretty clearly moved past and this to me seems like the point of intervention you need if you're going to try to make sure things are safe before you deploy them like track the people who are able to do these runs have standards for what it means to decide a system like this is safe i'm pretty happy sam altman's been pushing that stuff very heavily and if competently done i think this kind of regulation can be very important it can, could be great like the alignment research center has been doing great work here and i'm very excited to see what the um red teaming large language models thing at defcon looks like but, I don't know, maybe to close, I feel like I've been in the role of why alignment matters. Maybe I can try to break alignment arguments myself for a bit. Please do, yeah. Um, yeah, so if I condition on actually the world is kind of fine, um, probably my biggest guess is that the goal-directed notion is just like not remotely a good understanding of how these things work. And it's hard to get them to be goal-directed, and we just mostly coordinate and don't do that. And these systems are mostly just, like, extremely effective tools. It seems like kind of a plausible world we could end up in. I don't think it's any more likely than, yep, they're goal-directed and this is terrible. Um, we end up in a world which just has, like, lots of these systems that 
don't coordinate with each other, want di somewhat different things, are like broadly aligned with human interests, um, but like imperfectly, and just none of them ever get a major advantage over the others, and the world kind of continues to be about as the world is, with lots of different actors who aren't necessarily aligned with each other, but mostly don't try to see over the world except every so often. Um, or we just, alignment isn't that hard. Um, we crack mechanistic interpretability, we look inside the system, we use this to iterate on making our techniques really good. Um, it turns out that doing RLHF with like enough adversarial training just kind of works. Or with AI assistance to help you notice what's going on in the system. And this just gets us aligned human level systems and we can be like, please go solve the problem. And then they do. And I don't know. I think people like Yudkowsky are very loud about we are almost certainly going to die. And I don't know, we might, but we also might not. I don't really know. I would love to just become less confused about this. And I remain very concerned about this, to be clear. But I'm not like, 99% oh, chance we're all going to die. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> any, anything which is an appreciable percentage may as well be the same thing. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it, it's quite funny. We, we, I got a lot of um, pushback on the Robert Miles show. People said, oh, I can't believe it. You've, you framed him to be a doomer. And he himself said in the show, probably, I think about five times we're all going to die. And I managed to cut about five, well, I don't want to exaggerate, but that there was at least two posts on Twitter within 15 minutes of that comment where he said, and we're all going to die. So I don't think, I don't think I'm being, unf well, I didn't actually call him a doomer, but he basically is. Um, I don't know, man. I hate late lols. Like... Yeah. Eliezer is clearly a doomer. He's clearly a doomer. Yeah. Rob is much less doomy than Eliezer. Yeah. Is Rob a doomer? I don't know. I didn't call him a doomer, but empirically the data says yeah. yes. Um yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. It sounds like you spend too much time reading YouTube comments. I do. <laughs> too much time. It's notoriously the least productive use of time possible, apart yeah. from hanging out on Twitter, reading AI Flame Wars. Twitter is the worst. I know. It's so bad. I mean, we don't we don't need to go there, but we were we were having a brief discussion before um before we started hitting record. It's um why do you think otherwise intelligent, respectable people behave in that way? Impulse control, social validation, it's just kind of fun. People aren't very self aware about how they look. Or like aren't that reflective and Twitter incentivizes you to lack nuance and to yeah. be outraged about other people. Ah, I don't know. Um, I am very sad by many Twitter dynamics, including from people who otherwise seem worthy of respect. Yes. Yes. Mm. Interesting. Look, Neil, this has been an absolute honor. Thank it's you. It's been so extremely much. fun. Yeah, it's been amazing. It's been a marathon, but thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I, I really think we've had a great conversation and I, I know everyone's going to love it. So thank you so much. Yeah. I apologize for all the times I saw you off for philosophizing. Oh, no problem. It's, uh, it, it's, it's an honor. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks for having me on.